This Week in Startups is brought to you by Zendesk. Qualifying startups can join the Zendesk for Startups program and get six free months of Zendesk products. You'll also get access to an exclusive community of startups for advice and connections. Visit Zendesk.com slash twist today to get started. Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy to use cloud platform. Schedule a free product tour and receive your free guide, seven actions businesses need to take now at netsuite.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. Uh, it's June in 2020, and we might be coming out of the pandemic, or we might be going into the second wave of it. Um, we're dealing with a ton of social unrest and protest here in the United States, as many of you are, even around the world. And uh, boy, has it been a, a very interesting, unique couple of months here in America. In fact, it's been like basically nothing in our lifetime with the exception of perhaps 9-11, the Great Recession, 1987, we had a huge stock market crash, but that was kind of localized. In other words, this is one of the most unique, perplexing, confusing, and perhaps even transformative um, moments of our life, time. And I thought 9-11 would be the most, and, and this feels like it's uh, much more um, impactful than even 9-11, which I, at the time of 9-11, couldn't even conceive. And I'm really excited to have our next guest on the program because he's an interesting thinker. Um, and he came to me because we have a book club based on this podcast, This Week in Startups. We just started on a whim. You know, we have a Slack channel where a couple of thousand of us hang out each week. It's tens of thousands of members, um, hundreds of people posting interesting things about startups and entrepreneurship every day. You can join thisweekinstartups.com slash Slack. It's free, like everything we do. Um, we make money off investing in companies, not off charging founders for stuff. And so you can join us there and join the books uh, group. We did Bob Iger's Ride of a Lifetime. Uh, we just did The Fish That Ate the Whale, uh, the story of the Banana King. Uh, and then in between those two, somebody said, hey, there's a really interesting uh, book called Alchemy. And I said, Alchemy, oh, it's my favorite word or one of my favorite words. Uh, as many of you know, I'm a Dire Straits fan, and the greatest rock and roll album ever recorded live is Alchemy. And uh, this book, Alchemy, The Dark Art and Curious Science of Creating Magic in Brands, Business, and Life, really hit a lot of entrepreneurs, and I think they weren't expecting it. Uh, and it's a really great read. It's a great listen, in fact. And we have the author, Rory Sutherland, with us today on This Week in Startups. Hey, Rory, thanks for coming on the pod. Uh, huge pleasure. Really an honor to be here. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, now uh, I'm assuming you're in uh, the UK somewhere. Yeah, just outside London, between Seven Oaks and Westerham. So it's about twenty miles from the centre of London. Fantastic, and uh, you're living in your architecturally unique apartment, I take it, as opposed yeah, to a fancy new apartment. This is your architecturally significant apartment. It's one of the chapters in your book. Um, one of the chapters says that architecture is the cheapest way of buying art because the way people buy architecture and buildings starts with location, then size, and essentially down your choice architecture, aesthetics and design pretty much fall out at the bottom. Mm. And as a result, you pay a very trivial premium to live in an architecturally significant building. That is fascinating. I, I was looking at uh, a bunch of these type of buildings and I almost bought a building... Um, called uh, the Innes House uh, here in, and it was the house from Blade Runner, which was Deckard's apartment in Blade Runner, uh, Ennis House, uh, E-N-N-I-S. And it, they wanted like $4 million for it. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Um, I'll get it. It was in when I lived in Los Angeles. The problem was uh, <laughs> it, it's a Frank Lloyd Wright house and it was going to cost like $15 million to renovate because he made it out of these crazy Aztec tiles. Blocks. That, the block. I think correct. I know it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. It, it's a gorgeous house. Yeah. As, in fact, the, the he made like another little mini version of it. But anyway, the, the thing that's amazing about it is you're absolutely right. You can buy one of these houses, but you can't change it, right? Because it's architecturally significant. 
No, uh, I mean, that's that's the downside. Although, to be honest, if you have a kind of compulsion for uh, remodeling homes, the fact that you can't change it is a bit of a plus because it forces you to be happy with what you've already got. Um, and also, you can't change the interior with Frank Lloyd Wright either because generally they're all of a piece. There's a great website for your listeners, by the way, um, which I occasionally use as kind of fantasy browsing, which is right on the market. Yes. Which is the complete list of Frank Lloyd Wright properties for sale at any one time. And I think there's a gas station in Idaho, which has been for sale for ages for about half a million dollars, which is the world's only Frank Lloyd Wright gas station. I mean, how is that not for sale? I mean, what a great I office know. space. I mean, a cafe. Think about the possibilities. Uh, but I was literally on that website three months ago uh, looking um, because there's another Ennis house that was like a little version of it. And he seemed to work on a lot of themes. Uh, how are you doing with the pandemic uh, in the UK? Uh, and have you been quarantined in place? And what has that been like for you? Because I think it's an interesting jumping, on, jumping off point because the world has changed so dramatically. And I, we'll get to the book and a lot of the interesting concepts in it, but I'm curious your take on it. You know, how is this affecting life? How is it affecting your life? What do you think the carry forward will be? This is a terrible thing to say, and I really don't like saying it, because I'm conscious of the fact that it's affected people incredibly unequally. At a purely selfish personal level, I like it. I mean, I like working remotely. Um, I prefer Zoom meetings to physical meetings. It's brought home to me what an extraordinary amount of what is stressful in working life is nothing to do with the economically productive part of what we do. It's the extraneous crap that uh, ah. comes bundled with it. And so, you know, my actual work, by which I mean the part of my work which is presumably economically valuable, although you can always debate that with someone working in the advertising industry, whether there's any economic value at all. Um, but the actual <laughs> work is more or less enjoyable. It's like solving a crossword or something. Um, the things that contribute the stress are generally things like not being able to find someone's office at nine o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, going to the wrong meeting room. Um, and it's nothing to do with the real work. And so the part of my work that's useful, when I'm allowed simply to do that, I lead the life of a kind of not very diligent Victorian clergyman. You know, mm. it really is quite civilized and pleasant. Ah, now, I don't like saying this because yeah. I'm also conscious of the fact that if you're in a flat chair with a lunatic or you're in a place with no garden or outdoor space, um, if you have, for example, anxiety problems, this has hit you very, very badly. But it's, it's worth simply making the point that I think um, I think that the remote working bug mm. uh, is here to stay. Yeah, it, it is um, definitely addictive. I don't think that will revert. Yeah. And so if everybody is working remote, what does that mean for business? How will business change? Uh, which businesses will benefit from this? Which businesses will, will businesses be more efficient, less efficient? Will people be working more or less? What, what does the world look like if we're 10 years from now and people don't go to offices? Let's say 50% of people I mean who are going to offices now don't go anymore. I'm terrified of predicting this because it's something that's been predicted for so long. Hmm. Um, and I had a friend, funnily enough, in your line of business who was in, in Silicon Valley. And more or less, as soon as the internet came along, he bought property, I think, overlooking Lake Tahoe yeah. on the grounds that he thought that city property would plummet in value. Yeah. This was 1995. And that the most valuable thing you could own would be a fantastic view. Mm. And that was his logic in 95. Now, so far, he's yet to be proved right. The opposite has happened. And strangely, in fact, the internet made the world more centripetal, not centrifugal, because it concentrated activity more, I think, in about five or six megacity hubs. And so I'm very, very loath to make confident predictions about teleworking and remote working. On the other hand... We all have had a, an enforced glimpse of the possibilities. It's possible that teleworking and remote working is something which I suppose in complexity theory you might call a threshold problem, in that until about 30% of people adopt it 30% of the time, its benefits don't really become apparent. Right. And so, I mean, what it would mean would be it would, it would undoubtedly change property values, but ideally what I'd like to see happen 
is that the relationship between labor and capital, to use kind of Marxist terminology briefly, becomes a bit more nuanced. And so one of the things I've been talking to a guy at the Adam Smith Institute in London, and we said, look, the standard model of work is you pay people and they grudgingly come and work for you for the minimum hours necessary in exchange for money that they prefer to leisure up to the point of the margin. OK, now that's patently not a very good representation. People derive identity from their work, some parts of their work they find enjoyable or purposeful or valuable. But one thing I did say is the exchange between work and leisure can be more nuanced. So if you think about it as you have free time, which is leisure, but you also value free where and free when. By which I mean the opportunity to work at a place of your choosing which may not be home, by the way, but it may not be the office, and the opportunity to perform work at a time of day of your choosing has a value to it, which is independent of work-leisure, which is, I think, a false dichotomy. I, had, I learned a bit of this for two reasons. I was a very early Zoom um, advocate um, in the sense that, um, it, 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 to me, this was like in behavioral science, the Conundrum with moist toilet paper and video conferencing were two things that made obvious logical sense, but which nobody really adopted. No. Okay. And so I, w I regarded those as the kind of Fermat's last theorem of behavioral science. And so I did lots of experiments, even two years ago before the pandemic, with my own team, trying to get them to work remotely more. Thank and God, it, thank God that's where you went with it, because I was about to say, if you worked with your team to work on wet toilet paper, no. we might have to put a label on this uh, podcast. Yeah. No, I left, I left that to their own discretion, although right. I patently made it very clear that I thought that Mon's toilet paper was better. Yes. Uh, and um, when we get back from this, this quick break, I want to know, what, what actually is your day job? What do you do at your uh, when you work in advertising and then why you wrote the book when we get back on this week's search? Hey, it's a little weird right now. We all know that. And we also know that no matter how crazy it gets out there, we need to focus on delighting our customers. And it's super important to maintain those customer relationships. And Zendesk is here to help you with the Zendesk for Startups program. Zendesk really cares about their customers and they really care about startups and i'm just going to go right to the call to action here if you're an early stage startup with under 50 employees they want you to get started right now with six months of zendesk for free this is like the best offer you could ever imagine they love startups they want to support you they're going to give you six months for free nobody else is doing this and they are the gold standard zendesk.com slash twist every customer counts when you're a startup you know that and it's more important now than ever, so start building the best customer experiences with Zendesk. You can utilize their support and sales solutions and gain access to an exclusive startup community with resources to help you scale. Zendesk is a service-first CRM company with support, sales, and customer engagement products designed to improve customer relationships. You know all this. You know your friends in the startup community use Zendesk. They won't shut up about it because it is the gold standard. It's that simple. We use it. You use it. You need to use it if you haven't. If you are an early stage startup with under 50 employees, that's it. And that's a lot of you out there, probably at least half of you. Well, you can get started today with six months of Zendesk for free. Six months. You heard it right. Zendesk.com slash twist. Now more than ever, you need to have the best customer support experience. And you can do that most easily and elegantly and simply and now free with Zendesk.com slash twist. Get in there, everybody. All right, everybody. Uh, my guest today is Rory Sutherland. I want you to stop, pause the podcast, go over to um, Audible, uh, audible.com slash twist. Actually, you can get a free a book, I think. It's still up, the link. Uh, and, or go to Amazon or whatever bookseller you prefer and go buy Alchemy, The Dark Art and Curious Science of Creating Magic in Brands, Business, and Life. Uh, we were just talking about remote work, but just to tee it up, what what is your day job? What do you actually do for work? I know you were in advertising, but what exactly do you do? Uh, vice chairman's a great job because it's one of very few remaining jobs where you can more or less define it yourself. Um, I had a very good friend, J.P. Rangaswamy, who was chief technology officer of BT for a time. And he always said, never do a job which is pre-existing. 
because he said if you if you take on someone else's job you end up being defined by comparison with your predecessor whereas if you have a job title which didn't exist before ah. you have some degree of freedom of invention which i think is quite clever Hmm. Very clever, yeah. So when when these people invent bizarre job titles, maybe they aren't being entirely pretentious. They know what they're doing. And um, and that enables you to write a job around your own strengths. And a part of it, quite a large part, is what I call behavioral science impresario, which is continually making the case that, well, as I put it once, the, the next revolution is psychological, not technological. Ah, explain what that means. And... So quite a lot of that is suggesting that better understanding of what people really care about and what matters to people, because we don't know ourselves. One of the reasons you need free market capitalism is it's a massively well-funded social science experiment in discovering what people really want to do. Um, and we can only second guess at this, I think. And so one of the things I believe is that I think you can take, and I think advertising people, but not only advertising people, I think marketing people, psychologists, academics uh, in that space can kind of do a Darwin on capitalism, which is treat free markets as a kind of Galapagos Island uh, environment. And instead of doing what mo what mostly happens in business, which is people come along with a pre-existing preconception about how capitalism works and what its virtues are, and instead look at the anomalies, the duck-billed platypuses, the weird beaked finches, okay, and ask yourself, what does this really tell us? And I, I, I told a story at our Nudge Stock Festival, which was last Friday. Very simple point, okay. If I went into a board of directors, and particularly if they were wearing suits or they got an MBA or finance background, and I said, why are most fish restaurants by the sea? Or why are there so many fish restaurants by the sea? The What you might call the Harvard Business School answer is, you know, uh, you know, low cost of distribution, ready access to sources of fresh fish, you know, supply chain, logistics, all that sort of stuff. And actually, if you look at it in any depth, that isn't really a very good explanation. Because if you look at what really happens, if that were true, you'd get lots of fish restaurants five miles inland. Also, the best place to buy fresh fish reliably is probably at a fish market in a large city, not by the sea, where you may be over-dependent on three fishermen or whatever. I think what it is, is it's mostly psychological that when you're by the sea, fish taste better. Correct. And there's some evidence of this. I mean, rosé wine, apparently, I can't stand the stuff, but apparently it tastes better by the sea. And they've done experiments of this. There are various drinks and substances where, where the psychophysics or the psychogeography is very strong. I don't know if you've ever had pastis or perno, those French anise. Oh, drinks. the Ricard pastis. Amazing Ricard. when you have it on the two or the three with a little ice and a little water. You mix it yourself. Fantastic at a French bistro. Horrible at home. This Disgusting when you bring it home. You bring it. You bring a bottle home Cough because syrup. you've had this French bistro experience. It's undrinkable. Yeah, right. But in a French bistro, so, oh, so nice. Especially when a waiter brings it with an apron around their waist. Yeah. And so I describe myself as a kind of Darwinian um, business analyst in a way, in that um, I learned this, and I huge debt of gratitude to any of your listeners, Robert H. Frank at Cornell, who wrote, who's written various books, for example, the Darwin Economy. Um, and the economic naturalist, I think, is one of his as well. Um, that's a fan the whole Darwinian approach to business, which is look at the anomalies and the peculiarities and ask why, rather than coming along with your kind of creationist assumptions and imposing that model on everything you see. Um, I think it is extraordinarily useful in understanding what business really tells us, because it's an enormously well-funded social science experiment. And what can entrepreneurs learn from looking at business problems, looking at their own business and trying to think about the behavioral aspects of it, i.e. eating fish by the sea or rosé, um, you know, when you're uh, in the desert or by the, <laughs> by the beach, what, what can, what, can, how should we change how we think? What is the exercise we do in terms of opening our minds up to different possibilities as opposed to what we learned in a business book or when we're getting our MBAs? If, if you're prepared to abandon this kind of very dry narrative that um, uh, economies work because they're efficient, 
and instead consider that perhaps they work because they're adaptive or perhaps business successes are much less down to sort of price and efficiency and much more down to uh, psychological discoveries made either deliberately or accidentally. Mm. And then look at the evidence. And here are a few, I think, billion dollar ideas. I don't think it's, I don't think it's an exaggeration to describe them as such. Nespresso, Amazon Prime, um, Apple, specifically, I suppose, the iPod and iPhone, Red Bull. Um, I can uh, I can talk. Of, I can name a few more. I think I mentioned Dyson. Okay. Yeah, Dyson's a great one. None, yeah. Dyson's. Next, I think they are all really their value lies in either deliberately or accidentally stumbling on some psychological truth, which is counterintuitive or strange, and therefore had never been uncovered by anybody else. So let's do it for Dyson. So, like the Dyson is this fancy yeah. like five hundred dollar vacuum that just looks weird. Right. What? What? It, it what looks it, weird. Yeah. And I, to be honest, I'm, I'm slightly upset you chose Dyson because unlike, say, Red Bull, Nespresso, um, Google to a small degree, by the way, which I'll mention later, um, all of them are successes which are much more to do with fish taste better by the sea than they are to do with fish supply chains. And in the case of Dyson, this is the thing that I find fascinating. Okay, if you'd come to me, and bear in mind I've got a disproportionately high um, appetite for counterintuitive ideas. But if James Dyson had come to me 15 years ago and said, I think there's a market for an $800 vacuum cleaner, I would have basically said, Jim, mate, look, don't give up the day job, okay? Right. Because your idea is insane. You could have looked at all vacuum cleaners sold to date to the domestic market, and you would have said, you know, it's a distress purchase. It's a grudge purchase. You only buy a vacuum cleaner when your existing vacuum cleaner breaks down or when you're forced to move out of rental accommodation. Okay, that's the first point. There's no luxury end to the vacuum cleaner market. Secondly, you would have said, um, if we look at the kind of bell curve of price, we see that about three, $400 is the feasible maximum. And in any case, Jim, you've missed the absolute clincher, which is anybody who can afford $800 to spend on a vacuum cleaner probably employs domestic cleaners so they don't even use their own vacuum cleaner in the first place. 100%. And I would have smugly sat back and thought, right, that's got rid of his insane delusions, hasn't it? Yeah. Only to face the embarrassing recognition that he's a billionaire and I'm not. Right. So what did he what what is the psychological device at work there that made that idea particularly work, do you think? I don't I have to be honest, where I can explain Nespresso, which is a framing thing. <laughs> right. That because you pay by the pod. That previously, before Nespresso, the market for a 60 cent coffee that you made yourself at home didn't really exist. There would have been a few lunatics who bought unroasted Jamaican Blue Mountain and roasted it themselves in a shed yeah. who kind of paid that amount. But it was a tiny niche. Now, the interesting thing is because you don't buy Nespresso in a jar or a packet, you pay by the pod, your frame of reference isn't Maxwell House, it's Starbucks. Right. You're comparing result, it to, it's a third of a Starbucks. You're comparing it to a much more expensive alternative. Right. Okay. Now, the case of Dyson, I genuinely don't quite know. Um, and I have a theory, and that's all it is, is a completely untested theory, which is that if your vacuum, if you need a vacuum cleaner, you can, if you go in and replace your old one, you're $300 down and all you've got is the same vacuum cleaner you had before. And it's similar to my theory that you don't get an endorphin rush from mid-market retail. You get a thrill from an extravagance and you get a thrill from a bargain, but you don't get a thrill from the middle market. Right. Buying. Okay. It, so if you, to, to state that simply, getting a really good cheap cup of coffee is thrilling. Paying for a $7 pour over is thrilling, but two fifty. dollars Nah. nah, doesn't do anything emotionally for me. It's less than a Starbucks. It's more than I can make it at home. Falls flat. Yeah, what, what's the point? It's just in the middle. Just in I the mean, middle. The, the, only, the only clue I had is I went shopping for bedding with my wife once. And after looking at bedding for about an hour or so, it seemed like an hour anyway, um, uh, I eventually said, look, can we make a deal here? Can we either spend nothing or a lot? But my wife could have said, well, that doesn't make any sense. I said, well, no, no, no. Because if we spend nothing, we've saved 200 pounds, 300 pounds, 400 pounds. Maybe I can go and buy a drone. Right. Okay? 
That if would be emotionally pounds, exciting. That's emotionally exciting. Uh, that, you know, that would be fun. Yeah. If we spent 400 pounds, which is in the middle, I'd basically end up with the same bedding I had already, okay? And I'd spent 400 pounds. So where's the progress? On the other hand, if I spend 900 pounds or 1,000 pounds, I can get excited by thread counts, Egyptian cotton, mattress toppers, Oxford pillowcases, tog values, and I could nerd out in the whole thing. Right. And I will go to bed that night and go, ooh, this is nice. Right. Okay. And so that may be the same logic that that applies to the Dyson, which is, okay, we've got, we need a bastard vacuum cleaner. It, I hate paying for the thing, but at least if I buy one of these, I get a bit of a kick out. Hey, do you have a great idea? Do you want to turn it into a beautiful website? This way, you can reach out to your customers and partners and basically change the world. Well, I just was thinking the other day, wow, you know, we're doing so much remote now. And there's all these demo days that can't occur in person. What if we had a remote demo day? And I checked to see if the domain was available and remotedemoday.com was available. And then I said, hey, let's put up a Squarespace site. And my team rallied in a couple of hours. We wrote all the copy. We got a video made. And we had a beautiful website up and running at remotedemoday.com. This is what you can do with Squarespace. You can basically come up with an idea and start building your website, whether you want to blog or publish content. Maybe you want to sell a product or you have a service. Maybe you want to promote a physical or online business. Or maybe you want to announce an event or a special project like I did with Remote Demo Day. Well, Squarespace is the answer because you build it once and it's beautiful and it's customizable and it's so powerful with this e-commerce functionality built in and analytics built in and you can choose between over 200 extensions. You'll get great analytics, search engine optimization, free and secure hosting and 24-7 award-winning customer support and it's all optimized for mobile. That's what you get when you use Squarespace. They do have that 24-7 award-winning customer support waiting for you. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch use the offer code TWIST and you will get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Uh, thanks again to Squarespace for supporting the podcast for years and for making amazing, amazing software and amazing platform and having just that incredible wherewithal to just release feature after feature. Great job over there at Squarespace. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Yeah, I, I have I have a theory about it. Let me run it up the flagpole here and see what you do. Oh, lovely. Go. It, I think that we've been sold on having what I'll call like um, this like perfect life aspiration or delusion where we want to feel like because we watch television commercials where people are in some ultra modern house, they have this ultra modern counter, their hair's perfect, and they take that pod out of the perfect drawer where they're all color coordinated. We put it in, we have our espresso, it's perfect crema, we throw it away, we didn't clean. It's just a perfect life. And then you open the door to the clo- to the you know, your laundry closet and there's the perfect Dyson hung up perfectly cleaned and aligned and you mop something up or vacuum something up and you just feel like your life is perfect. That's what I feel like I'm getting sold all the time is the perfect life delusion. Is that what you guys are doing to us in advertising? Hopefully. I'm, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that one thing is, although Dyson himself is an engineer and con- is convinced that it is the engineering superiority of the device that commands its premium, he's not wholly wrong in that. But at the same time, um, if he'd made them beige and opaque rather than transparent, mm. I don't think he would have sold more than 10. Right. And it's it's rather like, I mean, we were talking about Teslas earlier. I have to admit that 20% of the reason I want to buy a Tesla is because of dog mode, and I don't even own a dog. But (laughs) the optionality of someday you might get a dog makes it interesting, or the fact that they took the time to create dog mode means they probably took the time to make everything else great. So, So there is a theory, by the way, which is of huge value to anybody in startup world, uh, which I think bears this out. It's called Kano Theory, a guy called Kano at the University of Tokyo. And he worked a lot with the Japanese consumer electronics industry in the 80s and 90s. And he has, he divides product attributes into three. There are kind of threshold attributes where they're table stakes, okay? Y- you, have to, you have to fulfill that role, but, but it doesn't create any excitement or premiumization. So if you buy a brand of milk, okay, um, Nobody goes, I love this brand of milk because the cartons don't leak. That's just something you have to do. In fact, if you don't do it, nobody will buy you more than twice. 
Okay. Then there are performance attributes, which are quite closely correlated to the central function of the device itself. And now threshold attributes scale in terms of human happiness sublinearly. Performance attributes scale linearly. And then there are these things called delight attributes, which are surprisingly gratuitous. You know, uh, the eject mechanism on a 1980s cassette deck, okay? You know, when you went to buy that thing, you pressed eject. And if there was a beautiful kind of damping act. Yes, the nice slow. With a little bit of a counterweight. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he always says they scale supralinearly in that, and they're the, they're, by the way, what's interesting about them, and this is why mad CEOs, I'm not calling Elon mad, but he's certainly eccentric, should we say, okay? The value of the mad CEO is the, the delight attribute is often surprisingly tangential to what the product's really about, e.g. the eject mechanism, for example, or the free cookie you get at Doubletree Hotels. And it's the first thing the finance, finance director wants to kill. Right, because it makes no sense. Because he sees this as a completely gratuitous cost center. Right. And, it's, it, it, and in finance language, it is. In psychological terms, it's an extraordinarily valuable value creation center and distinguishing feature. And I think, I think Carnot theory is really, really useful because, you know, one or, with, you know, with Uber, the real killer was the map. Okay, there's another billion dollar business. Right. Okay, the map, which fundamentally changed psychologically your experience of waiting for a car, even if it didn't reduce the duration at all. Just knowing it's on the map, knowing where yeah. it is, reduces the anxiety and delights you because you can go use the loo or have another drink if it's 12 minutes. But if it's two minutes, you want to close your tab and get outside. There's a Kiwi in, in New York called. Um, uh, David Rock, who who has this little mnemonic scarf, and it's five things that humans really care about, which economists and more rational people don't really understand: uh, it's status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. And you might argue that actually Uber probably provides the first three, if it does, you know, at the very least. Actually, the the, no, the first four, because the rating system is also a, is in fact a feedback between customer and company. Okay, so walk me through uh, so, those again one more time. So the Uber uh, status, has... Yes. Status, now the status thing is partly the map as well, because I, I don't know if you do this, okay. Uh, I occasionally be, effectively arrive on the sidewalk and time my arrival on the sidewalk to coincide exactly of with the Of course you do. Now. That is the, you're having we, the perfect life. And it makes you feel like Kaiser Soze at the end of The Usual Absolutely. Suspects, you know, when yeah. Pete Pothelswaite picks him up in the jag. Um, whereas standing in the rain going, I wonder if that's my car over there. That's Not a, a low status life. feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Not a perfect life. No. Okay. And so essentially those things which create the illusion of, of leading a perfect life deliver, even if, to be honest, the utility in economic terms they deliver is pretty trivial. The psychological utility they deliver is much, much higher than any logical person would think. But I think your perfect life theory, I think, bears, you know, I, I think there might also be other practical benefits so, such that where, because the Dyson's actually a bit of a status symbol, you don't even need to keep it in the closet. You know, ah, you yes, if it's it out, out it, it says something about you. It Absolutely. says something, you know. There, you know I mean, I, I've talked with Nassim Taleb quite a bit about this, that what we think products are for officially and what they're really for are often not the same thing. And so he came up with three categories. You know, the value of a dishwasher isn't principally that it washes your dishes. It's that it gives you a place to put dirty plates out of sight. Right. The value of a swimming pool is not to swim in. It's that it allows you to walk around your garden in a bathing costume without feeling like an idiot. Right. And toothpaste is a really interesting one, which features in the book, by the way, that we think we clean our teeth for dental hygiene reasons, plaque, fillings, prevention of gum disease, tooth decay, and so forth. If you look at when people really do it, it's really about fresh breath. That's, the, that's what you might call the proximate driver. It may not be the ultimate benefit, but if that weren't the case, why is 98% of the world's toothpaste flavored with mint? Right. We want to have fresh smelling breath in case we're going to kiss somebody or we're going to have a conversation. We don't want to offend people. So there's two things at work. One is 
the freshness of it. And the other is obviously, uh, you know, preventing plaque and our dentist doing that. And you, you made the point in the book that putting specs in it or a line in it made people pay more or be more engaged. Why would that be? Absolutely. Uh, stripes. Um, it's simply a kind of heuristic, which is if you if you want to tell people that the thing has two functions, when you think about it, striped toothpaste is utterly absurd because once you put it in your mouth, the two ingredients are mixed up anyway. So why keep them separate in the tube? But it simply makes believable the fact that this does two functions. Whereas if you had pink toothpaste, it's much, much harder for us to grasp that fact. Right. It's just there right in front of us. It yeah. reminds me of, we had a really interesting product. I can't remember the name of it. Producer Nick, maybe we'll look it up. But you could buy peanut butter and jelly, the American staple, in a jar. And it was sections, almost like slices of pie, if you looked at it from the top. A little bit of jelly, a little bit of peanut butter, a little bit of jelly, a little bit of peanut butter. And when you took a swipe of it and made your peanut butter and jelly, you didn't have to do two steps. It was just one step, one jar, one knife not two, a knife and a spoon in two jars. It's fascinating. Did it succeed? I I don't know if it succeeded. I think it's I think it's still on shelves, so therefore it did succeed. But no, I don't think it's like a big breakout hit. I think it's something kids buy because it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, and fun. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, it, is, it is fascinating. Um, and, you know, if, we, if we're to be absolutely honest about it, okay, how many people are buying an electric car exclusively for environmental reasons? Now, I'm not suggesting it's irrelevant as a consideration, um, but I'm not sure that the concern for the environment has quite the same immediacy as fart mode or, you know, or in some cases, by the way, just conversation. So one of the things I think that's very clever, that possibly what we see logically as a disadvantage with electric cars, um, which is the complexity, may turn into a strength in another year or two, simply because people love talking about cars. And the problem with modern petrol cars is there's nothing remotely heroic about a journey. OK, they're boringly reliable and there's nothing really you can say unless you start bragging about kind of a heated steering wheel or something ridiculous. Okay? We've talked Which about them for too long, to... right? I mean, we've been talking about like cars since the 50s and how amazing they were. And they haven't really been transcendent for decades. No, they haven't. Done, they haven't done a Dyson or an Espresso, really, have they, for about two decades. And so the interesting thing there is that... Um, uh, suddenly you have this thing which is conversationally rich and you can st sort of, you know, you can start talking about kilowatt hours and um, charging times and range anxiety. And, um, uh, and I, th I think people like that. I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, um, that th conversational value is often hugely underrated. I think when we buy products, we partly buy them to talk about them. Well, everybody, the last few months have certainly taught us what's important in life. It's also taught us what we need to eliminate or even change. It's the same for business. What are the changes you need to make? Do you have a hairball of multiple software systems and you could streamline on just one? Well, all you need is NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud business system. Finance, HR, inventory, e-commerce, everything you need. All in one place. You save time, you're certainly going to save money, and there'll be a lot less headaches, that's for sure. Whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in sales, NetSuite gives you visibility and control so you can manage every penny with precision. And that's super important now. Join over 20,000 companies who trust NetSuite to go faster with confidence. NetSuite surveyed hundreds of business leaders and assembled a playbook of the top strategies they're using as America reopens for business. Receive your free guide, the seven actions businesses need to take right now. And schedule your free product tour at netsuite.com slash twist. Get your free guide and schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash twist. netsuite.com slash T-W-I-S-T. Thanks again to NetSuite for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups. It means a lot to our community that you've been with us for so many years and supported us uh, so deeply. And I personally appreciate it. Let's get back to this amazing episode. That's fascinating. So the person who gets the latest uh, AirPods or the Apple Watch or the latest iPhone with the new camera, they get to show it to everybody else. They get to play the role of the vanguard 
they get to be the person on the cutting edge. And that allows for a conversation to occur. Nobody wants to talk about, you know, U2's album from 1984, but they would love to discover some new musician and talking about Jason Isbell or I don't know who, what new artists came out. That's much more interesting to be the person who's on the latest tip. So at the, at the simple level, it buys you a certain kind of status, but it also buys you a kind of convening power, doesn't it? Ah, uh, yeah. You know, that you can become the center of a group. Mm. That's fascinating. I, I mean, by the way, when I talk in these terms, um, everybody says, you know, what a really interesting and strange thing to say. And the point I have to keep making is that people have been saying exactly the same thing as me for bloody ages. I mean, Adam Smith um, in The Theory of Moral Sentiments was pretty much a behavioral economist, avant la lettre, as it were. Um, the Austrian School of Economics entirely believe that value is psychologically um, determined. It's not determined by objective reality, but by per perception. And the Austrians, of course, are the most advertising favorable economists because they argue that the ability of making something saleable and attractive through recontextualizing it or storytelling or whatever you use is just as much a creation of economic value as manufacturing is. Hmm. And there's this great quote by Ludwig von Mises where he says there's no useful distinction to be made in a restaurant between the value created by the man who cooks the food and the value created by the man who sweeps the floor. What does it mean? And he explicitly means by the man who sweeps the floor, marketing and presentation and so forth. Got it. Right. Yeah. And people are not going to the restaurant just for calories. There are plenty of places to get no. calories. They're going for some other reasons. And actually, there are plenty of experiments which show if you serve people Michelin-starred food in the wrong environment, they don't enjoy it remotely. Ah, the context, the set, the setting. The, this the, is the, the context, yeah. So context setting and framing um, is actually essential to innovation, really. Because you, unless you actually can describe something you've invented in terms that changes someone's behavior, you haven't got an innovation. You've merely got an invention. Got it. And I mean, the way I, the way I put this otherwise is, which, which is useful, I think, for the tech world. The tech world hates marketing. So I don't talk about marketing to the tech world. I talk about behavioral science, framing. Yes, you know, that's much and, more palatable and, because we look at marketing as like whipped cream. You really cream. hate it, don't you? Well, I, I've learned to actually embrace it a bit because if you reach your natural audience, how do you get people who are not in your natural audience, right? And I, I've actually thought about that a lot with my podcast or with angel investing. There are people out there who don't know what we do. So how do you get them into no. the fold, right? You, you kind of reach a natural audience at a certain point and then there's no $700 vacuums to be sold. You got to find some other market, I guess. And Peter Thiel in Zero to One is one of the few people who gets it emphatically. I mean, that's, that's a very interesting book, I think. Um, but I, I mean, put it put it very bluntly. Okay, there are two ways you can create economic value, which is you can either work out what people want and find out a really clever way to make it, or you can work out what you can make and find a really clever way to make people want it. And there's no useful distinction to be made between those two, which are they're two sides of the same coin, really. You had a great example in the book of um, a, an invasive species of fish. Uh, that yeah, uh, the lionfish, the lionfish, yeah. which was just disastrous when it got out in, uh, I guess, the Caribbean or South America because it was killing all the native species. And I don't know where it came from, Indonesia or something, but it, it didn't belong in the uh, in the Caribbean here, uh, in the Americas. Explain what happened next. No, no, I think it might have escaped from an aquarium. That I think there may have been some sort of hurricane and an aquarium burst. And a mating pair of lionfish escaped into uh, Caribbean waters. And it had basically, it was a hideously brutal predator itself, but it seemed to have no natural predators of its own, partly because of aposematic signaling, if you want to go in, uh, which is, it was a very weird colored fish. And so most other fish had learned to avoid strange colored fish. Yes. And what this is, it's kind of reverse signaling, which is, I'm such a badass, I don't need to camouflage myself or hide. 
So very distinctive coloration is, as with toads and frogs and things, often operates as a kind of do not eat signal. Yes. Now, obviously, obviously, some other species learn to mimic this with varying degrees of success. Generally, it might work for a time until the predatory species cotton onto the difference. Um, but um, uh, it had no predator. So what they actually did in um, Colombia, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, they encouraged humans to eat it and they turned it into a delicacy and they got Michelin starred chefs preparing it. They got the Catholic church to encourage people to eat it because on Fridays particularly. Yeah. And so um, it was an ingenious kind of behavioral solution to a problem, which is if we don't have a predator, the ultimate apex predator is actually man. And so what we've got to do is if we can't get other fish to eat this damn thing, we'll have to get humans to eat it. Yeah, and, that makes total sense. Uh, by the way, it, I mean, I think it it was more successful too than they even expected because by keeping the numbers below a certain threshold, it prevented the problem becoming um, uh, quite so large. They're, they're, it's a non-linear relationship somehow between scale of problem and number of lionfish. So even anything that reduced the numbers was having a disproportionate effect on solving the wider environmental problem. Yeah, it's interesting. And if you look at the banana, having just read this book, the I, I, have you read this book, the uh, the fish that ate the whale about the banana king, Zamuri? No, you have to tell me. You, you're the second person to have told me about it, so I will have to get around to reading. It's it. a it great book. Fabulous. It's basically about the banana, but the banana wars. Basically, you know, a an immigrant buys ripe bananas on a uh, on a dock and then tries to flip them to people and sell them uh, because they were ripe, and then he decides to go down and visit them in Nicaragua and Honduras and, uh, you know, makes a fortune. And it's just a great entrepreneurial tale. But one of the things that's interesting about it is they basically did an entire marketing campaign around the bananas. And they, when you got to Ellis Island as an immigrant, they gave you a banana for free. And that was most immigrants' first time to ever try a banana and they associated with coming to the new world, a new fruit, incredibly sweet. And then they did a marketing campaign of, hey, you know, bananas work really well when you cut them up and put them on corn flakes. They work really well in banana bread. And they did the same marketing. And you had a story about uh, potatoes in yours. And during yeah. our book club, somebody's like, hey, you remember that book we read, Alchemy? Didn't Rory talk about potatoes and somebody who made potatoes into a fancy dish? So. So what he discovered, it's variously attributed to a king of Portugal and Frederick the Great. I think it is Frederick the Great. Um, and he he wanted uh, Germans to cultivate, Prussians technically, I suppose, to cultivate the potato because it was a third source of regular nutrients, so uh, or second source. So you were no longer so dependent on corn or wheat. And that meant that bread prices and food prices would fluctuate less because you had a substitute if uh. the corn crop failed you see. And the problem was, is that when you have a king going around telling poor people to eat the damn thing, they tend to react fairly negatively. And they were saying things like, you know, we can't even get our dogs to eat the things. Why should we eat them ourselves? So he tried this reverse psychology and he declared the potato was a royal vegetable, that it was only to be eaten by the royal family. And he had a kind of royal potato crop at the Saint Souci palace. And it was guarded was guarded night and day, but with secret instructions to the guards not to guard it very well. <laughs> so pretty quickly, the neighboring peasants thought, I want a bit of that. And they snuck in and started stealing them. Uh. And so it was a perfect case where people doing something voluntarily will adopt that behavior far more enthusiastically than if they feel it's been imposed on them. Yeah, Which, bottom by the way, up is versus lesson. top down, right? It's a kind of, yeah, I mean, I guess it's a kind of lesson for governments everywhere that they tend to default to legislation, coercion. So, you know, I know that there are kind of really extreme American libertarians who really dislike nudging or behavioral economics. But what's interesting about government is it tends to default to economic in legislation first, economic incentives second, persuasion third. Hmm. Now, unless you're a pretty extreme libertarian, the very least you could say is, shouldn't we do those things in the opposite direction? <laughs> okay. Shouldn't yes. we try voluntary action first? 
And um, by the way, I mean, it looks as though if you want a COVID lockdown question, it looks as though the disease peaked in the UK before the lockdown was imposed. And that was largely achieved by enough people working from home and self-isolating to a degree to make to essentially make the difference between more than one and less than one. Yeah. So, so people you know, were pr people convinced themselves, hey, I should stay home out of an abundance I, yeah. of caution. I don't need to be told to do that. And why is it that Americans uh, are so resistant to be behavioral economics is that we we have such an independent free spirit. We don't want to admit that we can be influenced and manipulated and that we make our own choices. Is that the core of the issue? It may be. I mean, there may be a kind of hangover from McCarthyism and the brainwashing fears of the 1950s. So if you remember, the advertising industry pretty much um, turned tail and ran from behavioral science and psychology in the 50s, because you had films like The Manchurian Candidate, uh, you had books like The Hidden Persuaders, and there was a widespread paranoia about manipulation. And so the ad industry essentially turned its back on anything to do with unconscious, subliminal action. In a way, they overplayed their hand. They got too good at subliminal advertising or understanding human yeah. nature. And when they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar, people said, uh, you know what? Th this is too scary for you to be able to manipulate me like this. But there's also, I think there's also a strange thing that was just a question of timing, which is in the U.S., uh, nudging tended to be associated with the political left because its proponents such as Cass Sunstein and um, Richard Thaler tended to, were Democrats. Strangely, in the UK, it was adopted by the Conservative government. Huh. Um, who saw it as a way to solve problems through, apart from anything else, inexpensive interventions. Efficiency. Uh, essentially through psychological efficiency. Uh, yeah. Emotional efficiency, I think, is a useful phrase. If it doesn't cost, yeah. If, if, you, you, can get yeah. That, you can get it done so much quicker than with police policing. How would you look at masks and getting people to wear masks? Because this seems to be, there are so many psychological layers to being told you have to wear a mask, uh, being shown statistics that you can't perfectly model because you can't say, Put these hundred people in a room with a hundred COVID infected people without masks, and put these hundred with masks, and let's see what happens. Because you can't run experiments like that anymore; uh, they're too dangerous. How do you look at this uh, um, implementing do you know, do you masks? Know the interesting thing about that, uh, yeah. which is um, when smallpox variolation came along as an idea to the UK, they ran a series of incredibly unethical experiments where they deliberately infected people, but they solved the ethical problem in a beautiful way. They deliberately infected people who were due to be hanged with the deal that if they survived, they could go free. That's called a free roll. That's a free roll in poker. Uh, so you, you've gone. I was going to say, it's in, in poker, you call it a free roll. Like you got a free entry into a tournament. So you, there's only upside. There's no downside for them. There's only upside, essentially, because, yeah. okay, you might have a slightly more painful and lingering death, I guess, than being hanged. That's the only downside. Right. Um, luckily, I think all seven of them who had been variolated survived. And I was involved in a group of people who discussed whether variolation or some similar form of it might be a form of protection. In other words, you infect people with a deliberately small dose in a part of the body where it's less likely to actually do harm. Mm. Now, we still don't know whether that could potentially work because the kind of experiment you'd have to perform uh, would be considered unethical by, well, me, apart from the else, okay? Yeah. But it's one of the things we don't know as well, which fascinates me, and it, 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 it it's it's really interesting. I've long had the belief that there must be some connection between the size of the initial dose of the virus and the severity of the effects. Yes, In other this words, is it isn't pretty just a much binary known. thing. Yeah, this is pretty much consensus now is that if you're exposed to it for a longer period of time and more intensely repeatedly perhaps. Repeatedly yeah. perhaps, yes. The duration, the intensity of the exposure matters, which is why some young people uh, who are working in closed environments got it, but other young people didn't. And it's just hard to understand because you're getting all this anecdotal data and the things that are outliers stand out the most and get talked about most. 
And also young healthcare workers seem to have a disproportionately high fatality rate, don't they? Because you're exposed repeatedly and in closed spaces. Right. The interesting thing there is that if you tell people this, one of the things that worried me about the binary suggestion that you, you either get it or you don't, is it can lead to what you might call fatalistic behaviors, okay? Which is, in the First World War, the idea was either Jerry had a bullet with your name on it or he didn't. That essentially your survival was already determined by fate and it was a yes-no question. Um, And in the same way, I always thought if you tell people, look, not only is it a question of not getting infected, it's also a question of if you do get infected, get infected less. And then the mask question becomes psychologically much more appealing because the idea would be that the mask at the very least will prevent you getting um an enormous aerosol dose of this stuff deep into your lungs right and if people could understand that it'd be easier for them to wear them and there seems to be some crazy correlation and uh, let's go ahead and go there and talk about gender but walking through our towns here in california in northern california I noticed 100% of women wearing masks and probably 60, 70, 80% of men, depending on the part of town I was in, were wearing masks. Is there a difference uh, on a gender basis, you think, in how people look at this fatalistic approach? That's a new one to me, which is, um, uh, I mean, it could reflect something else, like the demography of the of women and men who are around at the particular time. Sure. Um there could be a confounding variable, but that, that that interests me. Certainly, I notice it more commonly. Mar- now, here's an interesting way of looking at it. Okay, until this pandemic happened, the only people, unless I was in Asia, the only people I ever saw wearing masks in public were um, tourists from Japan or China. Right. Okay, and I have to admit, okay, that not fully understanding what was going on. I took it a little bit badly because my the implication was that we were kind of slightly unclean guilos and yeah. that they were wearing masks to protect themselves from the miasma emitted from all these Westerners, you see. And when I saw people on the underground in London wearing masks, there was a little bit of me which went... You know, it was only then I discovered that the main reason for the practice is that the person themselves might have a small cold and they were doing it to protect other people as a pro-social act not a selfish act yes and so it may be that once you tell people it's pro-social it's possible that women are then more assiduous at wearing them than men are because they care more about humanity yeah it kind of makes sense Without without being accused of genetic determinism, I think there might be a bit of truth to that to generalization. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, it, yeah I, men murder each other at an alarming rate, right? So, I mean, if you just were to look at violence in society, it, it's irrefutable that men kill each other at a much higher rate than women kill each other. There, there is, I think you're allowed yes. to say that gender difference <laughs> for sure. And I had that same experience. I was in Japan and in a meeting... The translator was wearing a mask, and I was like, is it normal for translators to wear masks? I thought it had something to do with being the translator, because it was the first time I had seen it. And they were like, no, she's sick. And I'm like, oh, wait, who's sick? She's sick. I said, well, why, if she's sick, why is she wearing it? And they explained, well, because she doesn't want to get us sick. And I was like, ah, oh, got it. But I, because of talking about context, like a confounding variable, first variable that came to my mind was, well, look, the translator came in the room, and she's wearing a mask. I wonder if translators wear masks here, because... Why would they wear a mask? And it's trying to figure it out. Uh, and I had just totally misattributed the mask to her being a translator. <laughs> and so it's in fact, uh, and I actually, I suspect it's doubly valuable because it says, um, I'm wearing a mask, so you're free to keep your distance without seeming standoffish. So there are also questions that may also be a value to the mask as a form of signal, which is by wearing them, if I'm walking down the street and I see three people approaching with masks, I don't have to cross the street because I know they're reasonably assiduous in terms of following instructions. Whereas someone without a mask, I might go, I'll give them an extra wide berth because I can't be entirely sure they're not one of those people who ignores instructions altogether. So it does give you, it does give you a little bit of an early early warning mechanism as well. I think the American total horror at it 
I don't quite get. I mean, in one sense, of course, you're allowed to be more individualistic. You haven't had quite experiences as Europeans have, either of being invaded or of being very, very heavily threatened by a neighbouring power, um, not since 1812 anyway. And so, you, you, you know, there may be, you know, Britons within living memory can remember times where you just automatically obeyed instructions on how high you filled your bath. Food was rationed until about 1950 something in the UK. We accepted that level of government intervention in wartime. Mm. Whereas, I mean, I, were there what were what were the restrictions on consumption during World War Two in the US? There must have been some because obviously car. Yeah, I mean, I think there was the to... War Powers Act where factories were forced to make things that we needed, whether it was planes or tanks or yeah. machine guns, and people were. I don't know if they were actually forced to work in those factories, but I think yeah, if you were not at war, you had to go work in the factories to make bullets. So if you weren't firing the bullets, you were making them. I think was the sort of idea, but looking at. Um, you know, this situation, it seems like the rugged individualism of America uh, and not trusting the government, this can be a very powerful thing um, if you're, uh, if the government is trying to impose something evil on you. But if the government is trying to get you to wear a goddamn mask for your own good, it's actually working highly against you to not trust the government. And, and, that is one of the weird things that has occurred, and I'm interested in your perspective on it, is the loss of objectivity, truth, and trust in experts. We, You and I, I think, are in the same Generation X. I'm 49. I suppose you're in a, in a similar range to 54, me. 54, yeah. Okay, so we're in the same group. We were, I believe, educated similarly in that uh, a person who was successful or who had achieved uh, some amount of intellect or you know, knowledge you wanted to respect them. And now we live in a world where it's actually, uh, you, you want to trust your gut over what the intellects are saying to you. People who are scientists have an agenda. If they're telling us there's global warming, scientists telling us to wear masks, they must have some agenda or not wear masks. They have a different agenda. What are your thoughts about the, the loss of truth and everybody moving to my opinion is as valid as your opinion? Like, is your opinion as valid as mine when it comes to investing in startup companies or is mine as valid as yours in investing in advertising? Well, obviously not. We have two different life experiences. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough one. I mean, I think gotcha journalism does deserve a certain amount of criticism for this because I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what's going on, but, they, they, you know, that essentially after Woodward and Bernstein, you know, the high stakes in journalism were all about discrediting people in power, weren't they, really? Yeah. And... Uh, <sighs> There's a bit of me which which suggests that this is a bit excessive, and also the narrative that uh, twenty four hour rolling media. People always blame social media for polarization, but it's worth remembering that conventional media also has a vested interest in black and white stories of uh, you know opposition and uh, essentially creating an argument. I mean, the classic thing I always notice in the UK, and it's probably the same in the US is if you're ever contacted by a news station and they say, we want you to appear on this program about blah. Right. And you say, that's interesting because I have an extremely nuanced opinion about blah. Part of me thinks this, but part of me thinks something else. You'll get a phone call about 10 minutes later saying your presence is no longer required. Right. And they'll get some, essentially, they'll get some sort of Manichaean black or white obsessive to rant about it. And that is because um, conflict equals drama equals ratings. No conflict, no ratings. Yeah. And also, of course, the oversimplification of things um, is particularly appealing. We'll turn this into a... Um, I mean, in Britain, possibly less so in the US, this, sounds, this is a very rare point of view. But in recent years, I've occasionally gone into the Parliament building in the UK, into the Houses of Parliament, and you look at the meetings that are taking place around the building. And a very large proportion of those meetings are a bipartisan group of MPs from both the left and the right dealing with some complex problem, united in the interests of solving the problem as the best they can collectively. Okay. Now, if you watch the news or read the newspapers in the UK, you would have no idea that any of that activity takes place at all. The only exposed coverage about politics is entirely about direct conflict. 
And OK, you can blame social media, but it's worth remembering that the very same narrative that you know, social media profits from is also pretty convenient to conventional news channels as well. Yeah, if it bleeds, it leads. I, I, I mean, bluntly, um, I kind of, I mean, one of the things I, I generally take as advice from people like Nassim Taleb and the philosopher Alan de Botton is don't pay much attention to short-term news in any case. Read weekly or monthly magazines um, because... The signal to noise ratio in 24 hour rolling news is pretty much 95% noise. Okay. And so the other thing that I learned from on this is Robert Cialdini. I don't know if you've read his great book, Influence. He's in many ways the sort of godfather. He's at the University of Arizona. He's kind of the godfather of behavioral science in many ways. And he makes the point that most news bias. OK, most bias by news organizations isn't what people think. It isn't actually the news outlet telling you what to think. The bias is created by what the journalists think is important. And journalists don't have that much power to change my mind about free market economics or whatever it may be. OK, they're not going to change my mind, but they have immense power to put something on the front page or to bury it in the back. And there are two great quotations from film on this, from Citizen Kane. There's a line in Citizen Kane where I think Kane says, make the headline big enough and it'll make the story big enough. In other words, even if, to be honest, this is an arcane dispute only of interest to political nerds, if you put it on page one, OK, it's huge. OK. On the other hand, if you watch the film Spotlight, there's this extraordinary telling phrase, which is, we had, this is about the priests yes. and abuse scandal in Boston, okay? We had this story 15 years ago or 10 years ago, but we buried it in Metro. Right. Now, I've always got a theory that if you'd, ha if you'd put the Watergate scandal on page seven and page three and, yeah. and you know, page VII and the supplement, okay? Right. Right. You could have put exactly the same information there and the story would have gone nowhere. Mm. Back to context. Okay? Yeah. You might and argue framing. if you're a paranoid yeah. right. You might argue if you're a paranoid right winger that if Nixon had been a Democrat, then the news media would have done exactly that. Yeah, the framing it, it goes back to framing, right? Like the the sixty cent espresso yeah. pod uh, feels like a bargain compared to a three or four dollar uh, Starbucks, as opposed to a sixty cent pot of coffee and the whole pot being sixty cents worth of beans. And so. There is that thing, if you read weekly publications or you read, you know, longer term publications, they don't have that same echo chamber effect where they're all simultaneously talking about the same thing. When, when we try crazy ideas, you had an interesting X, Y or four quadrant graph. And I love a good four quadrant. And I'm, I'm trying to remember from memory because I listened to the book and then somebody posted it in our book club, the actual graph. But it was, you know, essentially being right or wrong with an idea being consensus or non-consensus? Uh, in other words, a crazy idea or an outlandish idea. What, what was the framing you used there? And maybe you could explain uh, that four by four. Thing, thing, th things that work, things that make sense. Okay, that's one four by four quadrant. Yeah. And there are things that work and make sense and where our explanation for why they work is correct. And most of physics, by the way, of what we like to think of science sits in that quadrant. You know, okay. the, what you call the hard sciences. Okay. So what makes sense? Yeah. And, and and also works. Right. But there's also space for things which don't really make sense, but seem to work. Huh. And that's because there's a second or third order explanation for their efficacy. Now, this is, this is going to go down really badly with your audience, but uh, constitutional monarchies are probably a good idea. Okay? <laughs> okay. Now, if you look at it empirically, right, we'll make a list of the world's constitutional monarchies. OK, you've got Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, um, uh, a few Caribbean islands. You've got Japan, Spain, um, Sweden, Norway, Denmark. OK, it's not a it's, it's not a bad. That's about 80 percent of the countries in the world where you'd actually want to live, isn't it? It's the now, highest functioning <laughs> democracies, in fact. It, most people say getting to Denmark as a term in the globalist world uh, or, you know, New Zealand as an ideal, an ideal high functioning government. Yeah. Uh, as and, opposed and to actually, a democracy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I don't know, 
I mean, very technically, I think the UK is a theocracy because I think it's actually a monarchy where the monarch derives their legitimacy from God. And then the monarch, through divine wisdom, chooses to outsource decision making to an elected representative body. Okay, So right. that's, that's, the, that's the, the technical structure of uh, British, British uh, government. Um, but there are advantages. So, for example, if you take the transition from Franco to democracy in Spain, the king was actually decisive in being seen as a person who was arbitrary but outside politics in enabling that transition. So it may be that there are Chesterton monarchs are a Chesterton's fence. In other words, most of the time they're not very valuable, but in certain unforeseen circumstances, they serve a, a function that you can't necessarily anticipate. You might also argue that if you have a very divided country, they create a kind of arbitrary unity in that you're fighting for king and country rather than fighting for country and a president you didn't vote for. Mm. Okay. Right. As a narrative. That, so, God um, save the queen. This is what... That I, I mean, I have arguments from the Seam Taleb about this because he, he, he believes I'm deranged. There are people, I mean, including I think Stephen Fry says the same thing, that on empirical grounds, you can defend, you know, parliamentary, democracy, uh, parliamentary monarchies. Canada's kind of OK, isn't it? Um, you know, it's not, as if, it's, it's not as if the Canadians are kind of laboring under oppression, is it really? Let's be honest. <laughs> no, no, it's high functioning. I mean, I, if yeah. the the correlation between what the public wants and what the government does, I think is pretty dis disparate here in America at the moment. Uh, you know, people want certain changes in society that we don't have. Like the overwhelming majority of people don't want to have uh, machine guns, you know, and high powered rifles, no. yet we have them, you know? We want gay marriage, we we want cannabis to be legal across the country and it just it, it's a real war to get there it's a it's a, it's a real <coughs> confounding uh process in, in, a, in a funny kind of way politics politics at the moment is kind of dumb isn't it because if you went to a bunch of people from what you might call fairly extreme left-wing protesters okay to people on the center right even, even actually on the fairly far right and you said what kind of country would you kind of live in or what kind of place would you like to live in okay well, people on the left would probably quote somewhere in Scandinavia. I don't think many people would say sort of Nicaragua or somewhere, okay, or Venezuela or you know somewhere extreme, okay. People on the far right might say Texas. People on the right would probably say people on the British right would probably say Australia, which is slightly right of centre-ish, okay. But the differences uh, differences between Denmark and Australia are utterly trivial, okay, in in, in most respects. Now. If you'd asked the same question in 1910 or 1920, okay, there would have been people on the right who wanted to live in kind of the 18th century, okay, and there would have been people on the left who wanted to live in Soviet Russia. But there was an extraordinary level of disagreement about what the nature of a successful and functioning country was. And now we have this incredible political division about what is really pretty pissy distinctions. So we've basically come to consensus in 90% of what society should be, yet it feels like we're mm. absolutely diametrically opposed as to what it is. Yeah. We're, and we're fighting on the margins for things that maybe don't matter as much. I'm going to defend conservatism a little bit here. Go ahead. Uh, my simple point is that the one virtue of conservatism, which is something it doesn't try to do, which is it doesn't try and shoehorn the answer to every question into a pre-existing mental framework. In other words, it's a bit more Darwinian and adaptive, and it's capable of adopting different frames and points of view in a way that dogmatic left-wing opinions aren't. So if you take an example of something like the assumption that the inequity uh, of outcomes or injustice is entirely down to racism, okay, that's true, but it's also hugely oversimplistic in the sense that actually one of the biggest forces, I would argue, uh, is white nepotism. Now, when I say nepotism, I don't necessarily mean intentional ne nepotism. It's that a lot of the most desirable jobs, if, if you think about how the world works in theory, how the world works in theory is you have a job and you get 10 people to apply for it and you then appoint the best qualified candidate to that job. If you look at how the world really works, it actually works through referral. 
And therefore, since people's social networks tend to reflect them ethnically, okay, referral, which often takes place in notionally very, very liberal businesses like Hollywood, is de facto racist. Okay, if you look at the tiny number of Latinos in Hollywood, right? Now, one of the fascinating things, if you look at, uh, there's actually a Wikipedia page, which is Oscar winners who are related to other Oscar winners. Now, statistically, okay, if Hollywood were a completely objective meritocracy, to have two people in the same family winning an Oscar would be vanishingly rare, wouldn't it? It'd be statistically okay. impossible. Like it would be getting struck impossible. by lightning twice. Yeah. And yet this page of Oscar winners related to other Oscar winners goes on and on and on, you know. And I'll tell you a story which fascinated me because I've never come across anything like it before in my life. But about fairness, which is there was a communist journalist on the Times in London called Claude Coburn in the 1920s and 30s. And I read his autobiography about 15, 20 years ago. He had an uncle who got a job with the Royal Bank of Canada. So he boarded a ship to take up a kind of graduate recruitment job uh, as an entry level um, manager at Royal Bank of Canada. While he was on the ship to Canada, a friend of his dad's happened to know someone on the board of the Royal Bank of Canada. So sent a letter to this chap saying, young chap called Coburn is coming to join the Royal Bank of Canada. He'll be arriving in a few weeks. It'd be nice if you looked in to see him. And the, the chap's father got wind of this, wrote to his son and said, when you arrive in Canada, you must resign your job. Because the fact that this friend of mine has unknown to me or un unprompted by me written this letter gives you an unfair advantage over the other nine people who will be starting with you. And I'm not willing for you to succeed on the basis of this connection. So you'll have to resign and go and find employment somewhere else. Now, can you imagine anybody doing that yeah. now? Okay. No, it, it, I mean, it, he was, I think it's astounding, isn't it? it it's amazing. I, mean, I read you, it and I was kind of like, yeah. Well, what, I, I think what's interesting about this is it's very hard to talk about race, especially in America, especially right now. And people, I think, want to believe a very specific narrative. Hey, there's privilege and there is only one thing, racism. Uh, and we're going to apply that, uh, you know, as a hammer, we stop racism and then yeah. this solves the problem. But what you just pointed out was it's not the person caught on a viral video, you know, using racist terms that's actually causing the racism. It might be the most uh, liberal, it, woke person in the world who hires, uh, you know, their daughter. Who hires their the mate from Princeton. Right. Yeah. The, guy, the guy in the double wide in, you know, in Georgia who's got a Confederate flag is not really on the appointments committee of Goldman Sachs. You know, right. If we look at it that way. Right. In terms of the power those people have. Th that person's racism might be screaming into like a cave, like nobody hears it. It's just screaming into the abyss. Whereas a person who is who believes themselves to not be racist, who believes themselves to be woke and progressive might actually be the blocker as it is in society. And it's fascinating. There's a group of venture capitalists who say, I only look at deals that are referred to me. So if you want to get to me, do not email me, get referred. And so what they're essentially saying is, I would like to perpetuate the, the existing system because you probably don't know anybody in the system. That's like saying coming to my country club or being part of your private I know. clubs in England is you got to get two people to refer you. How is it ever going to change? So this, by the way, happens when race is not a visible factor. So you will get, uh, you, what will happen is you'll get two towns with a slightly differing level of unemployment. And because most of the jobs, most jobs don't go through interview or a wide recruitment trawl, okay? What happens is you need a forklift truck driver. You go to one of your forklift truck drivers and you say, do you know anybody who can drive a forklift truck? And by the way, it's a very reliable form of referral because the guy isn't going to recommend anybody who's unreliable. So there's Correct. a social dimension to the referral, okay? Which is He's why businesses, yeah, businesses universally ask their employees first, who do you know who can fill this position? And in fact, one of the Silicon Valley techniques is to require each of your employees at a startup to give you three names of the best people they ever worked with. So when you come work at a startup, one of the keys is they say to you, okay, Rory, tell me the three people, I don't care what positions they are, that were the most impressive you ever met in your life. And that's how companies like Google or Uber or Facebook were built. 
Who are the three <coughs> smartest people you know? Let's get them over here, right? Uh, and that's going to result in perpetuating whatever statistics you already had. And so I, I, one of the things is once you understand what's really going on, and I, I'd love to talk to Nicholas Christakis about this because he really understands um, network effects. And people like Nassim Taleb would understand it. And the way you intervene once you understand what's really going on at a kind of second order level or a meta level, okay, is very, very different to the way you'd intervene if you have a totally shallow one dimensional understanding of the problem. One thing I do, by the way, I always have the principle that if anybody asks me for advice on getting into the ad industry, I basically say, yes, I'll give you a 20 minute Zoom call. And I always saw that as a way I was being essentially, you know, helping anybody who needed help. And it suddenly occurred to me that the people who have heard of me may not be representative of the right. population wanting to get into advertising, for instance. Um, you know, I was I was thought I was doing the right thing. Maybe I wasn't. Maybe what you need to do, for example, is to have a very a brief period of three months of every year where you can only hire people uh, through a different mode. Another thing I've put forward is if you hire people in groups, by the way, your entire mental approach changes because um, when you if you hire 10 people, if you've got 20 applicants for five jobs, your brain looks for complementarity and, and ah. variance. If you hire one person at a time, you look for conformity. Mm. That's so I got my first job as a weirdo, and I'll freely admit that I was a complete outlier, and there were four jobs available. And I basically got the fourth one. And someone told me later that someone had said, look, you know, we've got three candidates we know. We, you know, let's take a punt on the weirdo. Or yeah, let's get a wild thing. card now, in here. Let's get a wild card. We, let's get a wild card in. Let, let, yeah. You know, for goodness sake, you know, because, you know, let's experiment. Because you know, we can afford to lose one. Let's be honest, sure. okay? Yeah. Now, when you, if, if, you ha if those four jobs, instead of being four jobs simultaneously, if I'd applied for all four separately, I wouldn't have got any of them. OK, not a chance. And so I think I think there's an interesting there's a really interesting way of looking at this, which is in a sense, it's not institutional racism. It's kind of institutionalized nepotism. There's credentialism, I guess, nepotism uh, and uh, and I suppose, yeah, the whole business of kind of referrals needs to be looked at deeply. It, you know, what? it's an in it's an unintentional perpetuation of the current system is I think yeah. the charitable way to look at it because those people are yeah. probably at the same time going to meetings and saying, how do we increase diversity? And they're probably sincere about it. And they might be tweeting or Instagramming that they are in support of the protests and they're in support of social justice and they're retweeting and reading these important stories, but they just don't understand where to focus the change. The thing to learn, which I've learned, I guess, from Adam Smith and Charles Darwin, etc., is that intention doesn't have to be there to achieve outcome, okay? And also, good intentions do not necessarily translate into good outcomes, nor do bad intentions necessarily translate into bad ones. Right. It all depends on the, on the framework within which those kind of exchanges take place. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the book club that I want to make sure I don't of leave. Course. Casey asks. For some reason, my webcam, there we are, back, back in focus again. But now yeah, I'm no, really, I kind of like it though. Weird, weird. Yeah, it happens. Uh, <laughs> I thought you put a little Vaseline on it to get that more Hollywood. No, exactly, I know, to give that kind of misty look. romantic look. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's <laughs> Casablanca. Um, so Casey asks, what's your favorite behavioral study slash experiment or one that you found the results to be very surprising, i.e. the Milgram experiment or the Stanford Prison Study. We both know those are uh, experiments in sadistic nature of human behavior. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose either of those. I mean, there, are, there was another, another interesting Milgram experiment where he went around asking people to effectively ask complete strangers to give up their seats on the subway. Mm. And what interested him about that result was that most of the people he'd asked to do that just asked to be excused after the first day because they found it painful doing something which broke a kind of social norm. Interesting. And so um, I'm always interested in the extent to which um, economics does not capture a multidimensional view of human motivation. Uh, what, what would be the ones that would really – that's a great one to mention – um, 
Actually, one thing I'm a huge fan of, which I think is just very beautiful, Shlomo Bernatzi and Richard Thaler and their experiment with the Save More Tomorrow pension, mm. which is simply designing a pension so that um, you never get poorer, you get less richer, because the pension only kicks in every time you get a pay rise. I think that's that's ingenious. So and wait, explain how that asked, works. Yeah, explain how that works. So the standard way in which someone sells you a pension is you sign up, and from the moment you sign up to a pension, from that day onwards, immediately, you become $300 a month poorer, okay? And you're 27 or 34, whatever you may be, okay? And they designed it so you signed up to a set percentage amount. And the way it worked uh, was that um, uh, you paid nothing. You signed up to this pension. Nothing happened, okay? But every time you got a pay increase... 20%, if you'd chosen 20, 20% 20 of the incremental amount was automatically diverted into your pension. So you never feel pain. So you never, you never felt pain. You only felt less gain. Uh, and that was a beautiful bit of behavioral design, which, by the way, I mean, without going into this in huge detail, there's a whole field in mathematics called, um, it originally comes from statistical mechanics and physics, um, ergodicity. And the question of ergodicity, I don't know if you've come across this debate. No. But it's essentially the idea that uh, economics and probability doesn't understand the fact that an ensemble outcome isn't the same as a time series outcome. And quite a lot of what appears to be human irrationality isn't irrational at all once you consider the fact that we've evolved to live in a world where we're trying to avoid extinction more actively than we're trying to ob obtain perfection. So uh, I, I'm always split as to whether I recommend people Google ergodicity because it's one of those mathematical concepts. But one of the things I would argue, for example, is that economics wouldn't understand, okay, is Amazon Prime. Because what I think Bezos spotted there is that to an economist, you pay three pounds to have your book delivered because it gives you three pounds worth of utility or three dollars worth of utility. And what Bezos realized is that there's a big difference between 10 people buying one thing a month and one person buying 10 things a month. 10 people buying one thing a month don't really mind paying three bucks a month to have the thing delivered. One person paying buying 10 things a month, even if he's kind of pretty rich, goes, Jesus, I'm spending 30 bucks on bloody delivery. This is adding up. And I think, yeah. And, and this is really starting to add up. And right. I think. Bezos understood that distinction, and, and Amazon Prime is essentially necessary if you're to have regular customers. Because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that phrase: evolution is cleverer than all of you. So I'm not confident in those people who use behavioral science to shoehorn people's behavior into an, a pre-existing economic model or theory. I'm more the other way around. I look at where behavior determine where behavior deviates from the economic idea of rationality and ask whether there's a good reason why that might be. And it would make sense because when you think about it, we are we are in such a dynamic system. And we try to yeah. I try to talk about this with founders. You're not releasing your product into the world in which you studied business or economics in college. You're, you're releasing it into a new world and everything that's released into that world then changes that world. So it becomes harder and harder to predict. Whatever worked in your last company is not necessarily going to work in this one. I have a kind of mantra phrase, which is all big data comes from the same place, the past. Okay. Right. Now, there was nothing in the data that would have told you there was a market for an $800 vacuum cleaner. And there was nothing in the data that would have told you there was a market for the 60 cent cup of coffee. And what's very interesting home. about that is when you start looking at something like the pods, it feels like you go through an arc. After people fell in love with the pods, they quickly realized, and I went on a rant about this uh, many times, uh, when I realized when I was on vacation one time, how many pods I was going through when I was uh, in Australia for two weeks and my rented hotel, my Airbnb had pods. I was like, I'm going through six pods a day because I like a double espresso and I'm having three of them. And this is 20 days. I, you know, whatever, I was away in Australia. I've gone through over 100 of these pods and I looked in the garbage can one day and I said, this is not good for the planet. I'll never use pods again. And I reverse position and 
every time you create an efficient system like this, you have the chance of another phenomenon emerging. In the case of Amazon, they now have something called Amazon Day. So as a Power Prime user, we have so much coming to our house that we can now elect to only get our stuff by default on one day a week in as few boxes You're as possible. You're the same as me. I'm, yeah. Because I feel too guilty with too many boxes and opening up 10 boxes is more pain and suffering for me or 20 boxes than getting three on one day and the time savings. Absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, this is it, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. And I suppose that's also necessary for kind of environmental reasons. And in a sense, I suppose that sort of batch processing and consolidation saves Amazon quite a lot of money as well. It, it, yeah. And it saves you as the user money. So when if I told you yeah. you're ordering five books right now, and these are five amazing books we talked about in our conversation, and you said, uh, would you like to get them all on Monday? Or would you like to get them on you know, days before, up until Monday, Monday, Sunday, Saturday, Friday, Thursday, you'd be like, just send them all on Monday. I don't want to open five boxes. I want to defend an espresso by saying, at least in the UK, we send them back for recycling because they're aluminium so they can be smelted down and reused. Do you believe that actually the happens? Coffee on what well, percentage do you believe that actually happens or do you believe that is a virtual uh, signaling function? And how often out of 100, how many do you actually recycle? Uh, I have got a friend who's a Guardian journalist, uh, and he investigated this and found that there is indeed, you know, a warehouse where there's, he's shown me photographs of the, the, the recycling warehouse where these things are, in fact, melted down. So it's really? not entirely bad. It's, um, it's, it's happening actually, on some percentage. <laughs> um, no, I mean, the other question um, you mentioned about Amazon is your, I mean, the other, the other simple thing is that during lockdown, we've got so much Amazon cardboard in the house, it pretty much constitutes a fire hazard. So Amazon Day probably reduces that a little bit as well. So uh, we the manageability have now, of packaging. We have now looked at Amazon boxes as our art canvases. So I'd encourage everybody who has these coming to get a uh, box cutter and cut your boxes up put them in a stack and give them to your kids with paint and watch them use the different sizes to paint on. And you will never Brilliant have to idea. buy. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just the the absolute guilt you will feel over time with people wrapping things three times or four times. Like we, we wrap things when you buy a set of headphones, how many times are they wrapped? You have the Amazon box, you have the packaging around it, you have the box it comes in, you have the plastic it's in, and you have some velour, beautiful velvet case it comes in. It's like five cases. I actually had the Larry David experience where I had a pair of scissors in packaging that required a pair of scissors to open it. <laughs> I mean, this was the most absurd. It's pretty meta. Yeah. All right. Catherine <laughs> says, what's Rory's favorite alchemist moment of his own from work? Has he had to advocate for an illogical idea? And how did he persuade others to advocate, to take on that illogical idea? What's the most illogical idea uh, you made work? I'll tell you a very cute um, illogical idea, which is that price isn't price. It depends what you compare it to. And this is a very sweet little story where it proves that what you can do with behavioral science is that it's kind of scalable. It's fractal. You can deploy it in government policy with pension plans, and you can deploy it if you're running a small cafe, okay, which is one of the reasons I love it. And this is a case with my own father. So my own father 10 years ago, my father's now 89. 10 years ago, I suppose he was 79. And I wanted him to get the equivalent of cable, satellite TV, like direct TV in the States. And he doesn't like films, doesn't like sport, but he loves factual television. And I said, look, you've only got three terrestrial TV stations. If you pay £17 a month, you'll get 100 kind of documentary and factual stations, plus about 10 news channels. And he said, no, it's too much money. And I said, well, look, I don't mind. I'll pay for it myself. You know, I don't mind paying £17 a month. And he said, no, 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 I still don't want it because it's still too much money, even if you pay for it, which is kind of weird. Yeah, okay. that's just like dealing um, with your parents. Every person dealing like with their dealing parents, with parents ever. Isn't it? No, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'll buy it for you. No, I just don't want it. No. no. You know. And um, so in that weird way, I didn't know what to do. Because he'd bear in mind, you know, in Britain, we used to pay a TV license and everything else was free. And so for, you know, 70 years of his life or 60 years of his life, that's what he'd done. And then I tried this very simple bit of alchemy, uh, reframing, you call it. And I just said, well, in a way, it's not 17 pounds a month, is it? It's 60 pence a day. Okay. And he said, well, what's the difference? 
Okay. And I said, well, you spend two pounds a day on newspapers. So if you spend two pounds a day on newspapers, it's hardly ridiculous spending another 60 pence to get 200. And suddenly ah. it was extraordinary. It was like an epiphany. He the went, incremental oh, cost was mean. only 30%. And so he went and got it. Okay. He went and then got with his own money. And he's now this kind of evangelist for multi-channel TV going around the elderly population <laughs> of the Y Valley. Going, I can't believe you haven't got Sky. It's, and that's it. That's exactly the kind of case where it's completely wrong to think that the objective product you design and the objective price you attach to it on their own determine the success of that product. I, it's so interesting framing because I had this experience with my spouse, my wife, and uh, she wanted she hated upgrading her iPhone. And in our household, I am tech support. So she'd have this three year old phone. And she's a power user, and it's how old are your kids? Ten and four. So I have twins who are four ah, and a ten okay. year old. You'll have a very, very nice experience in about seven years' time or six years' time, where your eldest child will take on part of that role, which is yes. a wonderful liberation. Yes. Yeah. Oh, when they take on tech support. You buy them. I bought. I bought them a PlayStation Four. And I was going, oh, God, the trouble with buying this thing is I'll have to set it up. And then no. I realized, no, 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 they're 17. I just go, here you go. And the next thing you know is the HDMI cables are all plugged into the right place. And they'll do the and same for your that. new Tesla yeah. Y. Yeah. <laughs> they, they'll, they'll set up your they Tesla will. Y and figure everything out for you. And I said to my wife, I said, listen, this phone is $1,000 for the best one you can get. Over three years, uh, you're paying a dollar a day. And actually, you can resell the phone back for 200. So you're kind of spending like 75 cents a yeah. day. Mm. Uh, so if you buy it every two years, you're spending a dollar a day. And if you buy it every year, you're spending a buck 50 a day. Why don't we spend a buck 50 a day? And then you'll save me 10 hours of pain and suffering. And you wouldn't have to reboot your phone constantly and offload apps and all these other problems. And she finally agreed. Uh, when I framed it as the incremental cost and taking out the tech support cost. I said, you know, your time is spent with a broken phone. Every task you do is, and we had the same discussion looking at our ordering of groceries. She would compare groceries from three different stores and then order delivery of the milk from one place, the cheese from another, and the bread from another based on price. I said, your time is worth more than this. You see, I find this kind of behavioral thing really, in fact, my brother, my wife was exactly the same. And I just got her one of the large new iPhones and said, to hell with it. You know, yes. I, to be honest, I'd rather take the financial hit than have to answer all these questions where you have to delete apps because they're taking up too much space. Yeah, or the batteries my degraded. Brother's, yeah. My brother is an astrophysicist and was chief scientific advisor on the Anglo-Chilean telescope in the Atacama Desert. Okay, And yet he has an iPhone that's something like five generations out of date. And I kind of go, look, you're, the way mobile phones work in the UK is you kind of get free replacements as part of your contract. Right. So I'm going, look, look, I mean, in their cases, there isn't even a financial price you're paying. Just go and ask them for a new phone. Right. And he wouldn't do it. Ugh. And yeah. it's it's very strange. But this is why I said that, that along with my lavatory paper, our failure to adopt video calling. Now, if you think about it rationally, okay, there is this yawning gap in terms of human contact between a whole bundle of technologies like email, Slack, WhatsApp, uh, that are broadly speaking textual, okay, and the telephone, well, the post, if you want to include it, okay. And then there's this yawning gap until you get to, you know, $3,000 for a transatlantic ticket. And it's patently obvious that there's a gap in the market there. And yet, to use that famous phrase, yes, there's a gap in the market, but is there a market in the gap? Ah. And for two or three years, I kept asking, okay, Zoom and a few other ones, Blue Jeans, I think probably WebEx, had basically cracked the technology so it had reached a level of tolerable acceptability. You know, it wasn't like this, this call now, okay, we've had a cup of glitches, but it's not shit. Okay. No, it's fantastic. You know, yeah. and I, I'm wearing headphones. It's pretty much as if we're talking face to face. It's also worth remembering that the telephone strips out most of the um, audible, re mo most of the um, the timbre, because it's designed for an era of much lower bandwidth. So it strips down the human voice to what is essential for comprehension, but you lose an awful lot of nuance, resonance, and all the other things. So the, you know, the, the the audio part of video calling is almost as important as the video part. And um, 
And to me, for two and a half years, I've talking to the marketing director of Zoom, talking to Owl Labs, who make this wonderful thing called the I, Meeting Owl. I, I have it. I have one on the shelf here and one on the shelf here. We're, we're yeah. huge fans of the Meeting Owl. So are we, yeah. And it's, by the way, it's absolutely critical after lockdown because you're going to have a lot of hybrid meetings. Three yes. people in a room, three people at home. Right. So the Meeting Owl... I said the meeting hour is a major anthropological leap forward because for a million years, humans have sat in a circle and the conventional video call forces you to sit as if you're on a bus, all facing the same way. Right. And the meeting hour preserves that kind of centered round a fire or a dead antelope feeling of a meeting. Yes. yes. Okay. And so I'm glad you're a fan. I'm, in fact, I'm such an evangelist. They gave me one. Uh, I would just, just a bit of due uh, we, we, we buy okay. them by the, by the three pack uh, around here. And I got Ogilvy to buy 10, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, with, with, for people who don't know, it's a, it's a cylinder, a, a, a cylinder. It looks like um, a big bottle of Voss water or something. Like it looks like a little robot and it's got a robotic camera on the top and it's got microphones in 360. Whoever's talking, the robotic camera zooms in on them, but you also see a panoramic. So it creates a multi-pane experience for everybody and everybody is on equal footing. So a person who's at their lake house in Tahoe is seems the equivalent of the three people at the meeting around the table. It's fabulous. It and, really is. It, it's a wonderful thing. So I'm totally happy to evangelize it because it's one of the things. And it, it, it's a product that I was very happy to evangelize just on its kind of psychological. It's a perfect example of a tech problem that solves a psychological problem. What do we lose by being remote what do you think will be the counter because there's always a counter swing right we we talked about the you know getting your amazon one day a week and amazon day versus amazon prime in same day or second day what will be the the counterbalance to work from home oh. um so first of all even me as a fairly much um, you know, I've occasionally called myself a Zoom Zionist in that I believe that this is our natural homeland to work remotely in this way, okay, and that it is our future and our, you know, our entitlement in a sense. And um, the interesting thing there is that even people like me didn't propose that this was a five-day-a-week thing, I think. And, you know, it obviously is different meeting people remotely, um uh, versus who you've never met before versus meeting people remotely who you know. But it's not that different. And I was talking to Laurie Santos at Yale, who's originally a primatologist, and she was saying it's a surprisingly good, the research seems to indicate it's a surprisingly good approximation of human contact. Because as I said, you know, when I go to a conference and people wanted me to fly, at one stage someone wanted me to fly to Singapore to talk for 20 minutes and then fly home. Yeah. I'm going to go, what, do you want to smell me? I mean, what, what the hell's going on here? You know, this right. is insane. Okay. And it's a terrible use of time and fuel and everything else. And um, I, I think office spaces need to change, but in an unexpected way. And I've been writing about this a bit. They need to become what Nassim would call a barbell, which is two extremes, either highly sociable, coffee shops, uh, meeting rooms, places for accidental or predetermined human co-location and sociability and then a chunk of it needs to be like a library for people who don't like working from home but do need to escape because i think the modern open plan office is a classic example in my book one of my bits of advice is don't solve for the average right and the open plan office is neither sociable nor it's neither sociability nor is it solitude and it creates a halfway house which is actually the worst of both and experiments bear this out, which is that when you put people into an open plan office, bizarrely, the volume of face to face conversation goes down and the volume of electronic communication goes up by something like 60 percent. By the way, nobody, as far as I can ever see, has ever done a test on whether email, in fact, improves productivity, have they? No. Okay. We took this technology. We thought it's free and it's instantaneous. So it has to be good. And of course, for the sender, that is good. But for the recipient, it means that everybody, your inbox is essentially open to the whole world 24 hours a day. Is that good? You know, it also means that what's important and what's urgent. Have you ever read the Paul Graham thing, make a schedule versus manager schedule? Yes. You must know. You know, I know he's Paul, a Brit, yeah. I'm proud to say. He's yeah. actually a Brit, isn't he? I'm proud to say. So I think he's living um, there now, or, yeah. 
Yeah. Now, and that's one of the greatest pieces on different modes of work I've ever read. And it's half a page of A4, effectively. And so... What is his basic here, area think, there, as stated? Uh, yeah. uh, we've got a wonderful thing in Ogilvy, because David Ogilvy is on record as saying, I never, I've never wrote a single thing in the office. So his ads, his ad copy, his books, everything he wrote of any significance, he wrote at home or somewhere else. Too many distractions, he said. And bear in mind, that was in 1960 or 70, where he had a ruddy great office with probably three PAs with a bank of phones protecting him from disruptions, you know. And so something, what's so extraordinary about email, okay, is we assume it's efficient because we feel busy while we're using it. Now, I'm going to ask you for a little confession here, okay? And this, I suspect, everybody does this once or twice a day, which is someone asks you a question, which is quite interesting and quite important, but it's going to take you 20 minutes to answer it. And you know that there are 170 emails beneath that thing. And you go, geez, I can't quite face answering this now. What the hell do I do? I know. I'll ask a bullshit question in reply and I'll buy some time. So I, write, I hit reply and I go, that's great. I'd love to help. When would you need it by? Send. Okay. Right. You basically right? just put a pause on it. I go, phew, it. bought yourself 24 hours. Okay. Right. Now, as a result, something which in a Zoom call could probably have been settled by me chatting to them for seven minutes is now eked out to a five-day asynchronous exchange, which is quite likely to lead nowhere. Right. This is where the quick walk and, and we, talk. Ne we never look. We, we never did a cost-benefit analysis, did we? Because it saved money. It's this, and the same, is true, the same is true of the open plan office. We go, basically what happened is it saved companies a stack of money. So they invented this narrative around team working, you know, yeah. to post-rationalize the whole thing. You, it it saved money on the amount of square feet because you pack people more in. Yeah. And the idea was it created more socialization and maybe on the margin, some collisions. But in reality, because you're an open floor plan, you have to take extra steps to put headphones on and a little post-it, do not disturb or whatever. And... All of these people who go to meetings who are on open floor plans don't go to a meeting room. They just put their headset on from their desk and talk lightly. So it's well, here's what exactly thing, is, is happening. We spent, yeah. we spent most of the 1990s talking about the paperless office, okay? And I'm going to talk propose that for the next decade, we talk about the partly screenless office, okay? Now, my point about that is... Why, uh, and this has annoyed me for ages, why do people get up at eight o'clock in the morning, travel into the office, and then spend the first hour in, in appalling traffic, and then spend an hour and a half looking at a screen full of emails, which would have been exactly the same at home, okay? Now, one of my arguments is, maybe actually you need an area of the office, obviously this library area where people need to get on with things in a focused environment. They're free to use screens or not, it doesn't matter, because nobody's going to bother them anyway, okay? So I'd have a library area of the office where the rule is you can't approach anybody or interrupt them. You know, a bit like the, um, what was it called? Was it called the Diogenes Club or something in Sherlock Holmes? Mycroft Holmes was a member of a club, Sherlock's brother, where you weren't allowed to speak to anybody. Ah, it's kind of the introversion thing. And by the way, introvert rights is an issue because extroverts can bully introverts much more easily than the other way around. For sure. Yeah. Okay. You never get in a group of people, the introverts ganging up and going, no, screw that. We're not going to play softball. We're all going to sit at home and read Proust and you're going to do it too. Right. right you never yeah, get no. that. Instead, it's all people, no, we're having a softball competition. And, okay. And it's, it's completely asymmetrical. But, but the screenless office will be one where the whole point of being there is to talk to people. And therefore, the second you get a screen out, you create ambiguity because can people talk to you or can't they? And you can't tell. You can't tell whether someone looking at a screen is basically desperate for a bit of an interruption or whether they're focused on you know, whether they're seven seconds away from a cancer cure or something. Right. You genuinely don't know. It's interesting, a private club um, here uh, run by some Brits uh, called The Battery had a rule. Uh, when, when they started, they wanted to have no devices in the club, but then they realized people were using it as co-working. It was the main use case. So they came to the conclusion at 5.30 or 5 o'clock, devices were no longer allowed in these spaces. So they actually timed it, and they said, yeah, by all means, until 5 o'clock, but then at 5 o'clock, have a cocktail, put your phone away. If you have to check your phone, that's fine, but you, you can't be on your phone or your laptop.
That's very. It reminds me. There's a club in London. I think the Beefsteak, where it's um, uh, it, it's. I think it's it's still all male Monday to Saturday, but they have a rule on Sunday that you can't bring your wife as a guest. You can only bring someone else's wife. Now, when I don't know what's going on over there in the UK. Okay. You guys have okay. some weird traditions, but when I when I first heard this rule, I assumed that it was you know a deranged kind of you know, wife swapping things. Yeah. No, no. The purpose is that two of you bring each other's wives. So you're uh, a party of four. Got it. And the reason for that is that they said, if you have people with their spouses, they just talk to each other. Right. And all you'd have is a long table with people going, yes, I remember. Yes, it was nice, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And we went to Tuscany, didn't we? Mm, okay. Yeah. That's totally pointless. So it forces you essentially to create a social group to go, not just a, 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 a self-contained couple. So the rule is more intelligent or less salacious than it first appears. All right. A couple of quick questions from the book club. Uh, mm. Again, uh, for those of you who haven't, uh, pause the program right now and buy Rory Sutherland's book. Uh, alchemy it's amazing and if uh the dire straits album by the same name comes up buy that as well because it's they're both equally good uh have you listened to the album alchemy do you know it are you aware of it i, I know it yeah fairly well yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, it's live isn't it yeah that's the one it's, that yeah it's live with 14 minute versions of sultans of swing and telegraph road and you know mark knopf is one of the few m musicians who when you look at how perfect their studio albums are their live albums are actually even better and more perfect and perplexing of how in a studio, as perfect as it sounds, it sounds even better. I mean, when you remember when CDs came out, your first two yeah. purchases had to be either Brothers in Arms or Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. You had to buy a perfect, you know, um, rock album where the there was proficiency in playing guitar and, and drums, et cetera. Well, one, one thing, not wishing to compare myself with the dire straits at any level, one thing I'm really grateful I did is I read my own audio book. And the point about that is I didn't realize until I came to record it that if you get an actor to read your book as an audio book, they're only really judged on two things, which is um, clarity and fidelity to the original text. And I said, I don't want to remain faithful to the original text because right. there are things I'd write which I wouldn't say. So I... Now, literally, if you wanted to change do not to don't in an audio book when you're reading it out, you'd have to ring the author and request their permission, okay? I mean, okay. And I said, this is crazy. You know, we say don't, but we write do not. The, you know, those distinctions apply all the time. And I said, there are whole paragraphs I completely recast, and there were footnotes which I turned into discursions and so on. And um, the freedom to do that and the freedom to put a bit of extra kind of emotive shit absolutely it's Sorry. fantastic and i Watch actually shit. read no, you family can, podcast no it's not but it's putting putting for, investing for, a little bit of kind of emotional stuff into the um uh, into the reading i think really helps quite a lot of people have said they like the audiobook which the audiobook is up. tremendous and what i do i read my own audiobook my publisher harper business tried to stop me because they thought i would quit and I said, listen, I'm a podcaster. I'm not going to quit. I talk for two hours, three hours every podcast. Like, I'm not quitting. And they're like, well, most people suck at it. They quit. I'm like, listen, if you're a podcaster or you're a public figure, you have to read it yourself because that's the audience expectation is that they're going to hear your voice. They're going to be totally turned off and it's going to be inauthentic. But I had the opposite one, which was, I would say, the venture capitalists and that in the book. And then I'd say the VCs in the, you know, audio book. And they go, uh, stop. Uh, one more time, the venture capitalist. And I'd say, the VCs, and they go, no, no, the venture capitalist. And I was like, that's what I just said. And like, no, no, the venture capitalist, let's try that, not the VCs. And it turned out there's something where they sync uh, your Audible to your Kindle. So when I read books now, I bought your book twice. So I bought Alchemy, your ebook, and I bought the audio book because it cost me maybe $20 to do that. And the hardcover would be 30 bucks and your retention goes way up. But in your book, it kept breaking. And I was going to tell course. you about that. So when you went off on your tangents, I'm reading the book and I'm like, oh, here we go. Here he goes again. He's out of sync. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I, it never occurred to me that people would flip between drive time and evening time. No, no, but you do it simultaneously. Do. So what they've done in the Kindle app is when you're reading your Kindle book, if you have the audio audible book, it shows you on the bottom that you have it. When you hit play, they highlight the words as you're listening to it. So I was listening to your words 
and watching your words. And this increases retention. So of you course. should try it. Get a Kindle book and look for a Kindle book that says syncs with Audible. And it shows it on the Amazon page. And I've been doing this now. It costs me twice as much every time I buy a book. But I have my retentions and my focus is going up. Because when you're listening to an audio book, what do you do? You take your phone out and you look at your email. And then you stop remembering the words and you're mixing your email with the author's words and you're screwed. This forces me to stay focused, which is what movie theaters represent to me now. If I watch a movie at home, I'll inevitably take out my phone. The function of a movie theater for me is to make me surrender to the experience of the movie. Isn't this, isn't this interesting? Because the, the standard idea of everything is that when you introduce a new and possibly cheaper channel of right. consumption for any content, okay, that what you're principally doing is cannibalizing the original form. And it's the risk of this is always overstated, I think, in that, you know, video didn't destroy cinema, television didn't, you know, and so on. And, uh, you know, and the music industry, of course, had complete paranoia about downloads. Right. And live events, of course, have thrived in an age of music downloads because people can be more adventurous. Uh, weirdly, having the intangible music product seems to increase the signaling value of going to the con concert, buying the merchandise and all the other stuff. Or even in the case of my kids, buying the vinyl, for God's sake, drives me nuts. You know? Well, anyway, you know what? I, um, is, is it that they, is it that your kids are looking at this saying, I, I've, I got this album for free. I need to experience this. I, yeah. I, I, in some physical I, way. Yeah. I mean, buying the vinyl, I can't work out at all. But I mean, there we go. I mean, you know, um, uh, you know, I'll just have to put up with that. It strikes me as insane. You know, I it's a totem. It's like a, it's like life. a totem. It's a representation it's yeah. of it. Yeah. And it's costly signaling, of course, because you're obviously a fan because you own it on ah, vinyl. You've committed more. So it may, it may have a component of costly signaling to it. No one would have predicted that, I think. It's no. Fair to say. Vinyl is yet another category. Apparently, there was a period where if you were owned one of the last remaining vinyl pressing works in Europe, which were quite often in Eastern Europe, you were sitting on a gold mine, effectively, <laughs> because most of them had been shut down. Hilarious. And... Um, but, but no, I mean, I think you're right that going to the concert, buying the vinyl, buying the merch now has much more signaling power when the actual music itself is free. And I think they're gonna, there's going to be a really interesting question in the whole conference circuit, because the conference circuit, is, which is most of how businesses communicate with each other, it's not going to return really significantly for a year, is it? Because they're super no. spreading events, potentially. Now... We don't know what do you we, we held nudge stock, which is still watchable, by the way, um, about 20 or 25 of the world's best behavioral scientists starting in Australia and ending up in Maui with uh, BJ Fogg. Wait, Stanford. what is it called? Nudge stock? Nudge stock. Yeah. And we, we always held it as a sort of 500 person festival on the on the Kent coast uh, outside London. And this year, of course, we couldn't have it. And so we said, okay, rather than produce a kind of online compromised version of the original intent, we'll zag spectacularly and produce this 14-hour global ah. um, megathon. And so if you search for Nudge Stock 2020 on YouTube, um, I think it's also on the Ogilvy page and LinkedIn, LinkedIn Live. Yeah. Okay. You can pick and choose from literally, you know, 24 really interesting behavioral scientists. Um and uh, there's Cass Sunstein, for example. We've got Laurie Santos, who I just mentioned. Uh, fantastic lineup from across the world. And now the interesting thing is it was free because we didn't know what to charge. We asked people for charity donations and raised quite a few thousand pounds that way. But it was basically free. But we had an audience. Certainly the first four hours have been watched on YouTube alone. I think uh, it's 35,000 views. Wow. Now, if you add LinkedIn, you're getting to kind of stadium dimensions in terms of, okay, not every, not for a second do we believe that everybody has yet watched all four, any, every one of those people has watched all 12 hours. That wasn't really the point. We didn't expect many people other than the few kind of fanatics to go beginning to end, you know, Sydney to the West Coast. Um, a few people did, by the way. Um, but nonetheless, we don't know what to charge. We, we, nobody knows what to pay speakers who appear remotely either. 
you know, there were established norms around what you paid a speaker to fly to Amsterdam to talk for an hour, give a keynote, etc. Now, when what do you pay if they appear on a webcast? Hmm. Is it half? Is it? Is it? Um, I mean, it. In a sense, it's not any less valuable. I mean, it's a bit less valuable in signalling terms because I suppose you don't have the show-off look. My company's brought this Nobel Prize-winning economist over for your edification. And you also don't get to stage but, dive and ask for a selfie. You don't get to go to the no. lobby and talk to other people who also signaled they could spend a thousand dollars on a ticket. And. And as the scene points out, a large part of the American conference market was also a kind of tax efficient holiday market, wasn't it? Or vacation yes. market. Yes. So you hold a two day nephrologist conference in Scottsdale in March, interestingly, on a Wednesday and a Thursday. Right. So quite a lot of people travel down with their spouse, keep the hotel room for another couple of days. Of course. And, you know. And then there's the networking value. Now, I think what we'll have to do is we'll have to reinvent what the film industry does, where you have premiere, you know, theatre release, um, Blu-ray release. You know, next year, we'll have to work out a kind of price discrimination mechanism for um, Ted did it to an extent, didn't it? In the attending the main event was difficult and extremely expensive. Then there was a kind of sideshow event uh, which also had networking potential in Palm Springs, historically, I think. And then eventually it ends up being free on the web. And then there's TEDx, which is you get to pretend yeah. that you're, you. it's like the minor leagues. You get to pretend that you're as important as a TEDx speaker. And what you have to say is Nobel Prize winning potentially. I, my, here's my best idea for movie theaters. I want to know your best I, I th idea. I think you call that, what you call that in, in fashion, you call it an ex, um, Fast it's fashion? An expansion line. Oh, you know, I know it's what like you're Mew about. Mew to Prada. It's called a, an extension line or yes. a. You know what? Yeah. And restaurants were doing it too. You had Nobu next door at one point, which was the accessible yeah. version of Nobu, where, like, oh, you couldn't get the reservation into Nobu, but you could grab some, you know, tuna roll to go for 10 bucks or whatever it is. What's your best idea for theaters reinventing movie theaters? I'll let you think about it for well, a the second. Other one, yeah. The other one is yeah. reinventing physical theaters. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. Oh, physical for yeah. like uh, Broadway. Actually, yeah. real live theatre. Now, weirdly, and I can't explain why, it has to be live and it can't be recordable. So you have to create that event thing, which is we all sit down and we watch this. It's not something we can record, we can put on a PVR, whatever. It's you, you pay, you watch it. When I say to people, this is a really interesting framing question, okay? If you go to the London Theatre... Same as kind of Broadway in New York, I guess. What is it? 50, 60, 80, 100, 120 bucks a ticket and up. Okay. It's not cheap. Now, if you watch it at home on a 4K TV with a you know, 55, 60 inch 4K TV, whatever it may be, it's pretty good, actually. Okay. Um, now, the interesting thing is, it's worth remembering that could you charge the same as the ticket price or even the same as two tickets to watch it at home? Now, when I first say that to people, they go, other than heavyweight world boxing world championships, there is no way I would pay 100 bucks to watch something on my TV. But then I also say, well, hold on. When you actually go to the theatre, it doesn't cost you 100 bucks. It costs you 300 because you've got to have a meal out. You've got to pay for a babysitter yes, or yes. You know, if you've got young kids. You know, if you look at the incidental expenses, they actually add up to more than the two tickets. And then you buy very bad drinks at an insanely marked up price at the interval. Right. So it's you're getting on for an evening at the theatre. Once you add the ancillary costs, it's kind of being the price of a holiday or a short break. And I've argued that, you know, I would watch quite a lot of theater if I could do it that way. I, I would absolutely think about it. If you look at Hamilton and what a phenomenon it became, yeah. if Hamilton was available at its peak for $100 on pay-per-view, unlimited people at your yep. house, I think people would watch it all the time. And I think it would drive more people to go see it in person because it's repeatable. You would, it would be and like- you do something really clever. Yeah. You'd say one night only- it's ah. like 100, 100 bucks, only one night, not recordable, not pausable, nothing else. Right. Now, what happens, I think, if I'm right, when there's a kind of heavyweight boxing championship, the way it works is the guy with the biggest TV, or could be a female, I'm, yeah. I'm not, not stereotyping boxing yeah, fans, yeah. but they probably lean a little bit male. Okay. The person with the biggest TV essentially pays for the pay-per-view 
and then everybody else brings the beer. Right. So it's a kind of collective experience. Now, you could do that around theatre. 100%. You could basically go, yeah. I mean, I, actors would love it, right? Because my, they can make money while they're asleep. I, w- I was meant to be in London right now to see Local Hero, which Mark Knopfler of Dire Straits wrote the music for, but this goddamn pandemic uh, paused it at the old Vic. And if they and they sent an email to all of us and gave us one of the tracks, which I've listened to ten times now, uh, from the from the show. And I don't know why they put these things into like some secret I, they should do it on the first of the month if you had something like hamilton you said the first of every or the first saturday of every month you can watch hamilton you would get all these people did you watch it no okay i'm going to see it the next time what i think movie theaters should go to is movie theaters should run the same film over and over and over again f- 24 hours a day and you should be able to go to a movie theater anytime you want with your key card like a private club and open the door with your pre key card from a vip entrance you pay 30 bucks a month you can go into the theater and walk into any movie if you have, just like the, um, you know, when you go skiing, you have a season pass, a season pass for a movie theater where you can go in at any time with one person and There's watch any movie. There's someone in the UK who does it. You don't have a private entrance, but there huh. is somebody who does it in the UK. Really? It may have certain blackout dates like premieres and Saturday night. I'm not yeah. sure, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty much an all season pass that I think the Odeon offers it. And it's for, it, it, it's kind of, kind of Amazon Prime pricing, isn't it? Which is, yes. you know, the very frequent moviegoer resents paying the same price as the infrequent moviegoer each time he visits. And what if the movie th- and the movie theater is underutilized from, you know, whatever what, midnight till noon? It's underutilized. There's no nine a.m., eight a.m., ten a.m. Yeah. movie, and nobody's there. So if you made that, you know. Part of so, the so there's something really interesting about experimentation. And of course, people are terrified of experimentation because when you experiment with different models, it brings with it the inherent risk of destroying your old model. And now, what I think getting fired. You know, it, and getting, and, and, and getting fired. So it is the innovator's dilemma in a way. But generally, I think one of the most fascinating things I've ever heard is a friend of mine went to stay on Skywalker launch with uh, Skywalker ranch with George Lucas. Okay. Um, uh, and unsurprisingly on the Skywalker ranch, there's a home cinema uh, with massive seats and presumably popcorn and everything else with an enormous screen. And George Lucas said he never uses it. He goes into town to watch a film because what you want from a film is partly provided by the audience. And so when you're going to a cinema, particularly if it's a comedy, if you imagine, okay, you know, things are funnier when other people are laughing. A hundred percent. That's part of the joke. And, and, when, so and also buying... for horror films, when you get people get scared and they have a jump scare, it's great for the whole theater to cry out at once. What was the what was the horror film? There are two extraordinary stories I know. There's a horror film where a, where an arm reaches out of the lake at the very last moment and grabs the person in the boat. Oh, that's uh, Friday um, the 13th. Front of that in. Yes. Now, a friend of mine did that um, and knew it was going to happen and grabbed the person next to him at precisely the moment it happened. And she screamed. Um, right. When my old Russian teacher was at Oxford, two students were sent down for smuggling chickens into a performance of The Birds by Alfred Hitchcock. And in the middle of one of the most terrifying scenes, they basically threw the chickens into the audience. (laughs) Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I thought that was a bit brutal sending them down because it was exactly the kind of people I want to hire, to be honest. But there you go. All right, listen, I kept you for two hours. You're amazing. That's fantastic. This has been a a great conversation. I could literally go for two more, but I feel so guilty. Everybody, buy the book. Rory, we got to have you on again. And then at some point when things are happening in person again, I want to see you over there in London or if you're in the States. I uh, would love to have a meal with you if we're allowed to ever do I'd that love again. It. Next time you're in London, just let me know. It'd be an absolute joy to meet up. Be really yeah, fantastic. No. When Local Hero comes, um, and I'm trying, you have to find a way for me to meet Mark Knopfler. Uh, you must have. I'm in touch with his manager, and I was like, listen, is because I see we're Mark. We're in this Jeff- white person's network thing again, right, aren't we? Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you okay. could um, <laughs> perpetuate a meet and greet with me. Know- Do you know the strangest thing about society, which is at the top and at the bottom, it operates the same way. It's barter, okay? Right. And the reason it's all barter and exchange at the bottom of society is because people haven't got any money. And at the top, it's because money is embarrassing. 
Yes. And so you get this strange similarity between the way things work at the bottom of society, which is all about back scratching and exchange. Yeah, can you help me out? Also replicates itself at the top because you can't go, you can't go, I've got a Nobel Prize. And you go, I'd like you to come and speak to my, the pupils at my university. You know, here's 20 grand. (laughs) You can't do that, okay, with a Nobel Prize winner. So what the whole thing has to operate through favors and exchange. Right. And I will find out, I do, uh, uh, my, my music industry contacts are pretty rubbish compared to my behavioral science contacts, but I'll do my best. I know one or two people who might know. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I just want to visit British Grove Studios, which is a studio, and uh, just uh, you know maybe take a selfie and, and, and let him know how much his music means to me. I, I saw him twice on this concert tour, first row well, at the Beacon Theater. It was just an absolutely transcendent moment for me. Literally got choked up watching him play. And he's 70 now, and he's just a, gr- a greater songwriter now than he's ever been. And I just cherish the man and his work so much uh, that I just want to meet him before, you know, either one of us is leaving the planet. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a tough brief, but I'll do what I can. Fabulous. Yeah, I mean, it's actually yeah. kind of creepy and weird, too, I guess, <laughs> that I want to meet him so bad. But I just told this, I was like, when is his next fundraiser or his wife's fundraiser? I- I'll just ship it. And get a table, and that's the e- that's the easiest way. Like literally, if you want to meet Bruce Springsteen, I think donating 10k to his charity is the only way to do it. You can't pay him a million dollars to come play your no. birthday party. It's not possible. No, there's no amount no. of money. But if you're like, yeah, if you donate it to his charity, I'm sure he would come have a 10 minute discussion with you about uh, how thankful he was. Uh, so interesting. <laughs> so that's interesting. Fantastic. I uh, I listen. It's been amazing to to get to meet you like this. Zoom. Thank you for providing Zoom. Uh, the book, Alchemy, The Dark Art and Curious Science of Creating Magic in Brands, Business, and Life is a tour de force. It's one of those books you'll probably read every two or three years and get something new out of. And the the book club uh, at the, this at this being startups absolutely loved it. I highly recommend it. Go get it. And if you love it, write a review. For the love of God, write a review. The thing I like, which is I read a lot of reviews where people say they've reread it or yes. that they keep it on the they keep it in the bathroom and they reread it you know, with yes. their bowel movements or whatever. and Greatest, um, com- greatest compliment. The, the extraordinary thing I was thinking of is that, that extraordinarily small number of films, which are not only great films, but are rewatchable films. Give me your, give me a rewatchable for you. What's your rewatchable? Well, the, the, give me one. Now, okay. So, so I'll give you two examples. Citizen Kane isn't rewatchable. It's a great film, but it's not really that rewatchable. The third man, but equally Ferris Bueller's day off is really rewatchable. Absolutely. Okay. And the only box set I know that's rewatchable, this may just be me, is Narcos. So I wouldn't rewatch Game of Thrones. I wouldn't rewatch The Wire or any of those things. Strangely, there are two things I've spent doing under isolation. One of them is watching online YouTube RV reviews. Wow. Of are you, oh, you're into RV RVs. life? I'm investing yeah. in an RV company. Yeah. Tell, which one? I can't say right now. Oh, you can't say. But it's a startup say. that's, you know how they have these vans now? So people are yeah. doing something called van life, and it's an extension of the ro- remote work thing where they're converting yes. sprinter vans. And so there's a company that's going to take those vans and make them available for $200 a night or a, maybe $100 a night. You take them wherever you want. You bring them back. Instant that's vacation. Fanta- so the idea is it's a mobile office as much as a place to stay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So brilliant, you see, right? This is what fascinates me. So RVs I'll get you in. You want to get it on the deal? I'll get you, I'll get you a 25K slug. <laughs> I'll get you 25K okay, slug. Okay, I'm tempted, actually. You got me. I, you, all you're going to do is do one of your 50K speaking gigs. You put half of it towards this. You pay the, the British crown, whatever they get in the taxes. And then you, exactly. me, you get me Mark Knopfler. I'll get you into but if this you know deal. anybody, if you know anybody <laughs> at the U- U.S. Department of Trade, okay, if we're doing a post-Brexit trade deal, there's got to be zero duty on American RV imports, okay? Absolutely. That's my first demand. You, you can give <laughs> us all the chlorinated chicken you want, but I want that. So what I do is I, I mix those with re-watching Narcos. Right. <laughs> Great strange. rewatchable. Yeah, I've rewatched uh, a couple of Christmases ago is the Soprano series. Just a great rewatchable. I'm saving that up, but I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, that's absolutely. a great one. And then on the movie tip, for me, it's Blade Runner, Gladiator, Black Hawk Down, which are my uh, Ridley Scott trifecta. 
Uh, yep. Those three are just. Well, hold on, hold on. What, what about the two? Um, uh, the two of uh, what is it called? Sicarios. Are you not a fan of that? Oh, I love Sicario. Amazing. I absolutely love those. I have a great I one for you that you. Absolutely fantastic. Here's a great miniseries for you, and you have to get the long version of it. It was done by Canal Plus. It's called Carlos, and it's about Carlos the Jackal, who was the most notorious. Yes, I know. Uh, I'll you tell know you a very funny story. Go ahead. Uh, I'll tell you why I know him, because when I lived in London, we used to go to an Indian restaurant, and for about seven years, he lived upstairs. Okay. And so these guys who served us, <laughs> he was quite a regular customer. I can't remember if there was takeaway on the restaurant, but it was actually, he was quite a fan of Indian food, so kind of been all bad. And he was and, a terrorist um, yeah. who, yeah. at the time, terrorists were considered freedom fighters, and whatever they did was kind of noble as opposed to abhorrent. And so he was sought after as kind of like, it wasn't one cause, it was almost like whatever cause. It was like a Robin Hood kind of uh, vibe. And there's this movie, Carlos, um, which is a mini series. Canal Plus did it, it cost 18 million. It's in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like eight languages. It's recorded on four continents. It, maybe it's nine hours or something. And yeah, it's oh, brilliant. It's Eg Edgar Ramirez, who is, and it's 2010. When I tell you this is going to be your top 10 favorite films, guaranteed. Carlos the Jack. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll try and return the tip. Le Bureau, if you can find Le it. Bureau. Very good okay. French tip. Yeah. Oh, okay. And obviously, uh, other French things. Uh, Fowder's very good, Israeli se series, if you haven't seen that. Fowder. F A U D A. I think they're three seasons now. That's absolutely brilliant, Israeli. Is that, that what series. Homeland was based on, our series in America? I, I don't think so. Oh. I think it's based on – it's a very interesting group of, of, of um, essentially um, Israeli special forces people. Got it. It um, might be what actually Showtime is about because that was like the CIA in America, and they just finished up their like seven-year run. It is amazing how when you think on a global basis, America, the big exporter of culture, and of course, England before that, um, now we're looking for series in Israel or – you know, Korea, whatever, to remake those films here. It really does say something about globalization and culture that movies can kind of, and series I, can kind of- I've got a lovely little yeah. story about this, which is The Killing, which you probably remember being remade in English, I yes. think, by Netflix, I think it was. Yeah. That was a Danish series, uh, and it ran in Denmark, and the Danes liked it a lot, and then they forgot about it. Mm. And someone came over from Channel, from BBC Four, which is the, it's like the PBS of the BBC. It's the least funded, you know, um, kind of arts and intellectual channel. And he said, have you got anything um, that um, might be replayable on British television, from Danish television? They said, mm. well, we had this thing two years ago called The Killing, or Forbidelsen, I think it was, Forbidelsen, or The Killing. You could, and he bought it the English rights for BBC Four, but I think it was £24,000, which is wow. like the price of a second-hand car. Right. It became so popular on BBC Four, it then moved to BBC Two, it then became a cult on BBC Two, and then, um, as he said, uh, the Danish state broadcaster should have a statue of me in front of their building because eventually, by the time Netflix picked it up, they were earning millions from this property. Wow. And I said to him, it's a wonderful question, I said... Tell me, what, why did you particularly choose it? And he said, if you're British, he said, there's a great thing about the Scan Scandinavians. He said, anything Scandinavian, they're just the right amount of weird. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's a very, very good observation, which is you have these cultures which are, we, we basically understand what's going on, but then occasionally there are things which are, you know, slightly strange. Notable, it's, yeah. It's not, it's not so strange that you can't understand the context, but it's strange enough to keep it interesting. So even if you have a bit of a lull in the program, you start looking at their furniture or something, you know. Right. So, um, Yes, it is one of the nice things about the the international cinema. The, I mean, the only the only loathsome thing is now that America is so desperate for the incremental ten percent of Chinese consumers and dollars that we're willing to change yeah. the ending of our films for an authoritarian, brutal regime that tortures people. And in America, the the woke left, you know, most virtual signaling group is Hollywood. And Hollywood literally would change the ending of their movies to make an extra 10% yeah. from communists. It's crazy. Which is 
crazy. Yeah. It's insane. And nobody calls them out on it. It's like, how can you be these incredible virtue signaling folks who get up at the Oscars and give us all a big speech? And this is where I think Ricky Gervais taking the piss out of them is so brilliant. <laughs> That's the other guy. Okay. Listen, you're my representative, yeah. Rory. <laughs> when I come over, I want to hang out with Ricky Gervais, Mark Knopfler, and you. Mark Okay, it. well, uh, it's a very weird concatenation of people, but I'll do my they best. It will be brilliant. Okay. It'll be brilliant. Ricky Gervais <laughs> is my absolute favorite. When he comes there, he says, I don't care if I insult you. I don't care if you ever have me back. But you Fantastic. guys have no yeah. standing. You have zero standing to preach to any of us about anything. And they're just looking at him like, who invited this guy? It was extraordinary, wasn't it? It was one of the most brilliant sort of... Uh, it, what, what was it? If Al-Qaeda opened a streaming service or something, you'd yeah. be... You, You'd all be phoning them up. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, of course. Fantastic. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. Listen, Rory, uh, we're in hour three. I got to let you go. Uh, thank you so much. Joy. Thank you absolute very much. Joy. Everybody buy the book. It's amazing. <laughs>